6.30, so we can start, assuming we're ready. I will call the meeting to order at uh, 6.30 p.m. Um, Want to discuss who? There. Now I can discuss the uh, meeting logistics. If you're uh, appearing remotely, please uh, change your name on your display to your first and last name. Anyone who wishes to speak uh, must be recognized by the mayor and must be, uh, please, we ask you to keep your comments to the point um, and to indicate where you live. And anyone who speaks out of turn or discusses non-germane topics will be, uh, we'll try to rein you back in. And Councillor Bate will help us to enforce the uh, three-minute time limit for all speakers. And uh, I will ask, since we have one council member appearing remotely, uh, Councillor Cohn, would you uh, let yourself be known? Helen Cohn, as District 2. Okay, thank you. Um, first item is to approve the agenda, and we have a couple of changes. One is that we're not quite ready to discuss item number 23, the city manager's report. So we'll be taking that off. Number 18, the review. Oh, review. Right, sorry. City manager's review, number 18. We will take that off. You need the report off. Yeah. <laughs> and we anticipate having a separate special meeting uh, next Wednesday to, uh, to do that, but we'll be... Uh, there will be an announcement for that. Um, also, um, we're switching the order of a couple of the items. Item uh, number 15, the Country Club Road Work Plan, we will move up before item 12, the zoning amendments, because logically those two things are connected and, uh, and one flows from the other, so we will uh, do it in that order. Um, And I think that is about it. Does anyone have any other changes that we should be talking about? Okay. Um, next up, we have general business and appearances. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to address the council on uh, any topic that is not on tonight's agenda. And as long as you're Recognized by the uh, by the mayor, you can step up and give us your three minutes, and, and we will start with people in the room to see if there's anyone, any member of the public who wishes to address us uh, here in the room. Not seeing any. I will check. Is there anyone uh, on Zoom who's looking to be uh, recognized? And I, as always, I appreciate help from other people in the meeting, letting me know if someone's trying to, uh, to get my attention because there's so much going on, I don't necessarily always see you. And again, not seeing anybody. So we can move to the uh, consent agenda. I'll call uh, uh, the attention of the members to new item uh, I in the consent agenda, request to uh, fly the uh, Black Lives Matter flag for the remainder of the month of February for Black History Month, and we, uh, we didn't catch it early enough to put it on the agenda, but, but that's on now. And with that, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? And okay. All, any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, we have approved the consent agenda. Um, next up, we have a series of, uh, of appointments to committees. And I'll see if there's any of those 
applicants to any of those committees participating either in person or, um, or online. First, for the uh, ADA committee, we have uh, an application for reappointment by Marty Roberts. And Marty, are you on there? Okay. I'll, I'll just go through the list of all the appointments and then we'll decide what to do with them. Next, we have uh, Complete Streets Committee, David Ori. Is David Ori either here or in, uh, online? Doesn't look like it. And appointments to the Homelessness Task Force, we have Tori Roden and Marty Roberts. And Marty wasn't here before, probably not here now. And for the uh, Energy Advisory Committee, we have uh, Peter Sterling. And for the uh, Tree Board, we have Jay uh, Borland. And for the Conservation Commi Commission, we have Royce Meyer. Okay. What's your pleasure, folks, with uh, with regard to these appointments? We can. We have. We have a range of choices, including. We move to approve all these wonderful citizens who have agreed to participate and help us out. All right. Any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? I, I agree, that's right. We, so much of the business of the city couldn't go on and couldn't be done as well without all the committed and uh, able, knowledgeable volunteers to run, run all these commissions. So I really appreciate everyone who steps up to do it. And that brings us up to item 15, Country Club Road Work Plan. Turn this over immediately to the planning director, Mike Miller. We're going to have a logistical piece here. I loaded everything onto the laptop that died. Oh. So, excuse me one moment while I. Best laid plans. While Mike is loading, I'll note that the mayor asked that we make sure everybody had copies. We weren't sure who did or didn't have copies of the plan. So we had a few more printed up and put on all of your desks, and there is, I think, one or two over on the table. Let's try this one. It's not recognizing it. Thanks, Bill. So you can read it all and digest it in the couple minutes it takes Mike to set up. It will be uh, 214 presentations. And for everyone out there in Zoom land, uh, the, uh, the plan is also available on the city's web page. Do you want me to manage it? Whichever one works better for you. Let me just get here. Okay. So uh, while Kelly finishes getting it ready, I am Mike Miller. I'm the Director of Planning and Community Development here for the City of Montpelier. And so the first presentation I'm going to go through tonight is um, the 2024 work plan for the Country Club Road site. So as 
most of you know, uh, we've been working for the past couple of years on developing plans for Okay, um, on the Country Club Road site, uh, which is out on Route 2, uh, beyond the, uh, the John Deere dealer, uh, that's where the Country Club Road is, if you're not familiar. Uh, there's a golf course that's up and back. Um, so what we are going to talk about tonight is um, if we're going to advance this project, the city purchased this land, 135 acres, in order to do housing and recreation. Uh, those are the two primary purposes. And if we're going to advance this project, we need to decide uh, on our next steps and how to fund these next steps. So tonight, I'm going to quickly review how the public projects should be run, talk about what the preparation steps are going to involve. That's what we're working on now. And then we're going to review two options, and then we'll talk a little bit about the funding uh, we'll, that we'll eventually need. But we're not asking for any funding approval tonight. So plan, prepare, implement. Uh, anytime I'm going through and explaining how to do public processes, uh, public projects, uh, I always like to go back and just give people a, just a background of what it is and how we do it and why we do it this way. We really. Uh, from a planning perspective, break things into three steps. Uh, we want to plan, then we want to prepare, then we want to implement. And the purpose of this is really to minimize delays. Sometimes people want to get out there and get a shovel in the ground, and sometimes the best thing to do is to do things in a certain particular order. And I've used this for many years. Um, the planning step, um, we are a public entity, and public input is critical, so getting um, this upfront help from the public to determine what it is we want to do makes it easier for staff to implement later. We make the decisions and then we can act on those decisions. Um, and our planning process for Country Club Road concluded last June uh, and it kind of got delayed by the flood, very much got delayed by the flood and it's now moving to council and staff to try to see how we start to move this project forward. So oh, I touch one thing and it, everything goes away. So preparing, uh, this is everything that happens between planning and putting a shovel in the ground. So this could include permitting, funding, finding development partners. Uh, in the case of what we're talking about here with Country Club Road, it also involves zoning changes, uh, growth center expansion, which is a state program, and TIF. So the implementation step, um, we, or more specifically in this case, our development partners are building the infrastructure in the project. Uh, and this could, in our case here, be something that we do in multiple phases and may involve savings pasture eventually because we might need to connect these properties. <coughs> and how long each step takes depends on the characteristics of the project, but generally, I usually tell people it takes about one year for each step. And we are just now starting the preparation step for Country Club Road. So we should expect at least a year's worth of work to get the plans drawn up, the permits pulled, financing in place for each of these pieces. And that's two sets of pieces, our infrastructure piece and our developer's piece in order to get them ready. Um, so uh, also timing depends on how we go about our preparation step and we'll get a little bit into that. So what are we talking about when I'm, um, the, the staff, the team we have here um, recommending? We really have three separate tracks that are all working at the same time. Uh, we have a developer track, we have a city track, city staff track, and we have a recreation track. And we'll need a little bit of direction from on the developer track from council, and we'll go through that as we get going. Let me first talk about the city's track. So there are things we have to do as a city to get this site ready to move forward. And one involves zoning changes. That's why we ask to have this moved ahead of the zoning changes, just so we can kind of preface. We need these zoning changes. That's why the zoning changes are coming to you, and that is needed for both the project and for growth center eligibility. We then need to apply for growth center expansion. Uh, that's needed for possible Act 250 exemption and for TIF. Uh, the growth center ends at Sabins Pasture, which is the property to the west, so we would need to expand our growth center by one parcel, this parcel here, the Country Club Road site. Uh, the city needs to plan, uh, continue planning for infrastructure. So the roads, the sewers, the waters, we have in the planning step gone through and put 
um, good orders of magnitude information and got you know what we believe to be the needs and we're now going to have to put more work into that to start identifying the exact costs and locations where are we going to put that road specifically not a kind of we're going to kind of put a road here we really need to get to a point where we know this is exactly where we're going to put the road um, and then we've got to start having a TIF application which is going to be needed to pay for that infrastructure So the recreation track, um, if you remember back to the Country Club Road project, we set aside 12 acres for recreation because they were not quite there. They had a number of studies going on, so they're continuing to work on it, the Community Services Department, and they're going to continue to work on it as we are doing the planning steps for the city. Um, and if, these, if the planning, if their work results in a recommendation for facilities at Country Club Road, then we can build them into this first round of implementation if they're ready at the same time as our TIF application is. And now the third track, um, and this is the one we kind of have, I expect to have a little bit more conversation on, is the developer track. And we really have two options, and both have advantages and disadvantages, and this is what we'll kind of be looking to you for guidance on whether you have a preference or not. Um, and we're, I'm gonna go, go through a number of steps and I just want to say up front, this isn't every step. There are votes, there are permits, there are lots of things. But just to give an idea of the two tracks, the developer track number one, we would seek the development partner first. And I think I've talked about this a couple of times. We would run an RFI or RFP process to gain interest from a development partner. Then council selects one or more to complete proposals, outline their general approaches. We would, you would select our partner. They would work on their due diligence, their environmental and their financial side. They would be working with us, while at the same time we design the infrastructure in a location that best supports their project. So we're basically working together to design how this project is gonna move forward. Um, so uh, that would provide us very good estimates for increment and infrastructure, those are the two pieces of information we need for a TIF application. How much increment, how much new tax list, uh, tax, new taxable property will we be creating? That's what we call tax increment, the new taxes. And how much infrastructure cost there's gonna be. If we're working together on what their proposal is and what our proposal is, we have good numbers for that. We can then apply for TIF. After we've got TIF, we can finalize development agreements and sale of land and move to implementation. Obviously, as I said, there are a number of other steps that are in there, but we can compare that to uh, option two. So option two is to do TIF first, and this is the recommendation of our consultants. And so in this scenario, the city is gonna put a little bit more money and time in up front. So we're gonna pay for the due diligence on infrastructure improvements and create a likely location for utilities and roadways. The city will then um, project what we think are the likely development potentials. And we would use those estimates to develop our TIF, op TIF application. In this TIF, tax increment finance application, would go to VEPC, um, which is a state board who does the approvals of these. And what VEPC does is reviews it, and if they approve it, we get a percentage of not only the local taxes, but a percentage of the state education taxes. And we use that money to pay the bond that is needed for the infrastructure to make that project happen. So that's what TIF does. We take taxes, we don't, we're not getting those taxes now, we wouldn't get them unless we do this project. We take that and we help to pay for the infrastructure costs. In this scenario, we would get the VEPSI approval and then do the RFI, RFP to identify the developer. They would develop their project and if necessary, we revise our plans. We then, um, we are ready to send a project amendment to VEPSI to revise the estimates in final. When approved, the project can move forward. So a little bit of why one and two, the advantages, oh, now it moved. If I touch that, it takes off. So the advantages of the first one, I mean, some of it are obvious. There's less cost to the city. It, you can see by the track, it would be faster. There's less revisions because we're working together from the start. The disadvantage 
is there's less certainty for developers. And the concern that our consultant has, uh, and they're familiar with the development community, is that, um, that we may lose a number of good potential developers because they're not willing to take the risk. They don't know we're going to get TIFF. And so they would be inf investing a lot of money on a certain amount of speculation. So the, the disadvantage to the first one is maybe we don't get a good develop, maybe we don't get um, as many good developers as we could have if we waited till to do number two. The second one, number two, uh, more certainty for developers, so we're likely to get more interest from developers, but the process is gonna be a little bit slower and there may be more upfront costs to the city because we're doing those soil borings, those preliminary um, plans. We're not, we can't use our development partner to go and say, hey, if you guys do this plan, we can help shoulder some of the costs, but they're doing a lot of the work. In this case, we're doing all the work ourselves. So those are a little bit of the the pluses and minuses of the two models. And this is the last slide for what's next. Um, once we have a direction, we can do an RFP process for either consulting services, um, to either get somebody to help us with the RFI, RFP. We, we don't have the staff um, expertise to run a request for a proposal process like this we would probably put that out have somebody help us guide us through that process people who have the connections with the development community to be, make that more likely or we would be doing a tiff which is very likely to be white and burke they're pretty much the only shop that does the tiffs so um, if we chose um, the second option we would do the we would do the tiff get white and burke on board let them start working on that um, these would all come back to the council for your approval Either way, we've got an estimate from White and Burke that we're probably talking $130,000, $150,000 over the next year to go through all of the processes, whichever order we do them. Um, so we should start thinking about reserving that amount from the Country Club Road proceeds. Um, and the city will continue to advance our pieces, so um, there's no cost for us to be doing the zoning updates, the growth center application, and those pieces because that's stuff that I will be doing in-house um, maybe with Josh's help on some of those things. Um, and we're going to continue to look for grant opportunities and state aid. So some of these have costs, but that doesn't mean we're not looking for grants that may also be covering some of these costs. And I think with that, I can take some questions and... Thanks, Mike. Um, there we go. I, uh, I'll need it for the next two I, I just noticed as I sat down at my desk, my desk that the, the date of this final report was June 28th. So we know what it would happen 12 days later. <laughs> so it's been, it's been tough. But, you know, people have raised the question about how is the city going to be a developer for a pro project like this? And the answer is we're not the developer, right? Correct. Um, we are going to be um, finding a developer that's going to be doing the development. This isn't uh, a city-built project. Uh, it's going to be a project that you, as city council, when we do the RFI or RFP process, we're going to be putting things to you, and you're going to help the guide what it is we're going to ask. Um, we want a developer who is going to give us um, a certain amount of affordable housing or protect certain things or meet a certain threshold of housing units and then we turn it over to the developer to then go through and say bring us what your vision would be for this that's why we usually narrow it to a, to a handful of them um, when I did this for Barry City's City Place. We had three interested developing firms. Each one of them invested a little bit of money to do SketchUp models of what they thought their proposal would look like. They're not final plans, they're not blueprints, but it gave a sense for City Council to go through and say, we really like option B or option A, whichever that one is. They And that was how they selected it. But it's the developer's plans and it's their vision. And the question is, does their vision match your visions? And we just have to work together towards finding somebody who helps us and maybe somebody says I can do this in four build four separate buildings and maybe somebody else comes in and says I would do it in one big building that looks like this um, and you 
be able to look at the various alternatives to say, I like what this person does, or this person has a better track record. They've been doing this longer. They have you know, uh, $28 million worth of investments in their um, portfolio, and they manage thousands of units. And here's somebody who hasn't done that with that much experience. We'd rather have the guy with, or gal with the experience. Now, I would imagine that the number of companies that do this kind of thing and also the number of opportunities around the state for a project of this magnitude are both pretty limited. Do you, so are, are the firms that are out there to do this already like, conscious of Montpelier as a, as a site that look, is wanting to go forward and are you hearing from anybody? I, I haven't had that. I mean, we have White and Burke. They have their ears to the ground on things. Um, we have been in communications with folks at the state who've been contacted by, by developers who are looking for projects, and they're trying to steer them towards the Montpelier project. So um, we can't go much more into to detail into those. But there, there are folks who are interested in bringing um, new development to this area. And I think we won't know until we really get out and get the RFP and RFI out there to see, you know, to gauge that. Do we get only two people who are interested or do we get, um, you know, do we get eight or ten that we really have a lot of people, to, a lot of firms to, to choose from? And I think, I don't think we'll know until we actually get the applications out. Mm -hmm. Or they may be interested but not available for a year and a half, in which case, or two years, and that's a decision council would have to make to go through and say, this firm is worth waiting for if they're willing to do the project. Um, so I think we won't know until we put out a proposal and start to see who comes in and what the interests are. Now, with, uh, with regard to the, the two choices uh, you laid out about whether we do some of that work at the front end or we wait or we let the developer do that either way what you're talking about is not are we going to build the roads and put the wires in and pipes in right away it's really just are we going to do the studies that yeah, will prove the it is we're, we're, yes we're doing the preparation step so we're going to be um uh, basically going from roughly where we're going to be putting the road to getting it exactly this is where we're going to be putting the road because we know exactly where the buildings are going to be and we're going to know um, we do engineers call it doing the 30 60 90s 30 percent 60 percent 90 percent we get everything nailed down and we know exactly how much uh, additional fill we need what the gravel is what the paving is going to be how much sidewalks they do the plans because they're before we can go to construction we need to get our permits and so usually somewhere in the 60, 90 range, they're going to start going in to get permits um, because you don't want to finalize your plans and then have them changed. You'll come in and get your permits when you have a pretty sure project. Uh, I would expect we'll probably have two separate applications, one that would come in from the city. So there's going to be a certain amount of subdivision to create a parcel that the developer is going to build. And the road is going to get subdivided out from the underlying parcel. It's going to be its own 50 foot wide property and the city is going to be the one responsible for sewer and water. We may not be putting it in. We may work with our contracting partner. They may build it to our specifications. Um, it just depends how things work out with the development agreement. We may put it in, they may put it in, and we just cover the cost with the bond mm -hmm. to put but, in the infrastructure. But we wind up owning the roads. We road, end up owning the, the road, the pipes, yes. Mm -hmm. Um, and I know there's discussion in the plan about roughly how much we can expect the infrastructure is going to cost and where's the, where the money is going to come from. Could you talk about that a little bit? Josh has a better grasp of the exact numbers that we're talking about, but uh, the last I heard, uh, uh, you know, talking, Josh is putting in an application we were talking earlier today, and some of the numbers, it's, it's less than $5 million worth of infrastructure if we go all the way back to, um, because in our preliminary study, in the, in the actionable master plan, what we, what our consultants did was to look at what were all the potential barriers that would say this project can't move forward. And one of the 
uh, things. It really wasn't a barrier, but it was noted that we would have to improve the infrastructure back to the roundabout. So water and sewer from the roundabout to Country Club Road and then up Country Club Road would all have to be improved. So that's new water and sewer lines back to that intersection. There is a, um, a pump station that needs to be upgraded. Now some of these costs may be covered by FEMA, but just all the costs would be the pump station, everything up to Country Club Road, up Country Club Road and into the site. And that would be just under, you know, it would be under $5 million. And so how that gets financed, I, I got into, I mentioned a little bit with this tax increment financing. It's a very um, common tool that's used around the country and around the state. Um, and really what you're doing is um, state law allows us to take the new tax revenue or 70% of the new tax revenue of a project and use that to help pay the bond that's needed to build that infrastructure. So you would take $5 million, uh, you'd have a 30-year bond on it, that would come out to a certain amount of money every year that has to get paid, and you need a certain amount of taxes, new taxes, that would have to be generated to cover that cost. And what is in the actual master plan was basically, if we looked at 300 housing units, there would be more than enough revenue, especially if we have state TIF to cover all of the costs for a $5 million bond. There's, it actually is, is there's plenty of, of money in there for that. But the total infrastructure cost was much larger when you went further into the site, right? Yes, so yes. We're, $5 it, million uh, is just to get us, just to work clear, that's to get us to the first area. Yep. So it gets us Which to the first not, area, don't yes. Understand, <laughs> and that's what the, so when we talk about the, the TIF has a lot of extra money, some of that extra money would be going to those next phases. So we want to run that road up the hill so we can build townhouses on that second level. We want to run that road potentially across into Sabin's Pasture so that way we can have two forms of egress to this, uh, to this neighborhood that's gonna cost money. And we don't have those exact numbers yet. That's gotta be one we've gotta work on um, in the next year to get more studies in that area. We're looking, uh, talking to the state now about seeing if we could get some, some grant funding to help cover the studies of where would that road go? How much would it cost to build? Um, there's a lot of questions that are out there with that. This first part, this phase one that we're talking about is just what it would take to get into the, the bottom of the site. And I know other people have questions, so I just want, have one more for right now. Um, is it is it possible to estimate at all the likelihood of getting one approval for the growth center expansion and two approval for the uh, TIF designation? I'm very comfortable about the growth center, and we've had a TIF before, so I don't see any reason why we wouldn't. We've got a lot of support, a lot of support from um, the administration, and so uh, there's obviously a recognized need around the state for um, housing development and the need for housing, and our new TIF application would be much more specifically targeted to um, Sabin's Pasture and Country Club Road, as well as a, a parcel that's owned by Casey Ellison, and, and we might need to cross VCFA if there was a connection to College Street. But again, we haven't had that discussion. Um, we haven't gotten that far yet, but there would certainly be at least those two parcels, probably the third parcel that would be put into the TIF application. Okay. And I'm, con I'm confident we would be able to get through those. And that's a substantially smaller TIF district than what we had before, which stretched from Sabin's Pasture all the way down to Capitol Plaza area. So yeah, and for people and for legislators or for people who are concerned that you know this is too big or this is this, this is really very targeted towards. Here's the site. Here's the infrastructure needs. Here's the increment they're going to be developing. Um, I remember years ago when White and Burke was talking to us about it, the previous TIF. Uh, project that one of the things they said was when you're doing a TIF you don't do it just to in the hopes that it'll attract development you should have identified development and tailor the TIF to the identified development it's not if you build it will they will come doesn't really work in this uh, no. environment okay anyone else have any questions or did I exhaust them all <laughs> 
Lauren. Yeah, I guess just continuing with the TIF thread, like it looked in your um, kind of options that that's one of the bigger kind of X factors for a developer if they don't know if we're going to get the TIF. But it sounds like you're pretty confident. Is this the kind of thing where if we meet certain criteria, we should get approval? Or just like how does the, how much unknown is there really in it? Like, and mostly I'm just thinking from a developer's perspective, how much is that? Like, obviously you want all of your boxes checked, so everything's certain. But if it's like, yeah, we've got all of the right criteria, there's no reason we shouldn't be approved, we just haven't gone through. Like, how is that going to be weighed? Because if that's the biggest difference, then that seems like an important factor. Yeah, and I don't think I can answer that question. Um, it's, you know, my, my sense was, boy, I would think if I was a developer, I would be getting on board. But I'm not a developer. So, uh, you know, I think I would see this is pretty obvious. Uh, we've, the, the administration, there's a lot of discussion. The city itself owns the property. There's, there's just a lot of stuff that says this, there's a very good chance this project will move forward if, if I put in the capital to build housing here. Their advantage as a developer, um, it, this could be it's up to the council how much they pay for their parcel. It could be um, it could be they don't they pay a dollar for their parcel. So they're looking at it. Hey, I don't have an I don't have an upfront cost. Uh, I don't have an infrastructure cost. I'm getting new infrastructure and new all these pieces here, and um, that's how I get the and and the TIF to to pay for any any other uh, needed infrastructure. So there's a lot of advantages to getting involved in this project rather than say buying a piece of greenfield and doing the project on your own. You've got a lot of advantages. You've got administration. The White and Burke certainly has the opinion that was their recommendation was that they felt stronger that we would have a better get a better pool of applicants if we went and waited to to do it. It's just a little a little bit more as you can see from the process, a little little more redundant process, but that's not necessarily something that can't be overcome. Donna. Along those lines, if you actually decided to just go with option one, let the developer take the lead, could you f find out pretty quickly how that was working and then switch to the TIF if you needed to? Or the TIF is so time consuming and has specific deadlines, you really don't have that flexibility. You either start with the TIF or you don't. If, if we had the consultant, we would probably be working with White and Burke very quickly thereafter to be starting the TIF. There's a lot of preparation work. It's just the application for the TIF can't really go in. We're basically, at that point, committing to the fact that we're going to be going in with one TIF application, very clearly defining what our needs are. Um, so the TIF application kind of has to wait till the developer has got a pretty firm idea of what their project is going to look like and we have a pretty firm idea of what but I was thinking if you actually started with one and you found out that you didn't have as much interest from developers or not the interest you wanted could you shift to the other you could yeah if yeah if we put out an RFI or an RFP and we didn't get any interest or the ones that came in the council looked at and said I'm really not seeing anyone here that really excites me. We've got, it's nice to have some interest, but you know, mm -hmm. they, they don't have the experience or they, you know, I'm not confident they've got the financial backing uh, or whatever, when you look at their, their pro formas and their applications that you feel we'd be better off waiting. Then you can shift the, the B and start doing that. Again, that adds a, adds a little couple of months of, of delay because we, it takes time to go through an RFI process. Well, that's what I was wondering. Is that two months, three months, four months? Uh, be honest, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> the honest answer is it's a, what, it's what the consultants, I was going to say, that was what I put in mind was that the, uh, if we're going to go with an RFI process, I would be putting out a quick bid to hire somebody to do that process. That is not something in-house that we you know, we're not, we're not land brokers. We're, you know, how you, you know, the questions and the information, they need to be helping you develop the RFI. And they need to be helping you. What is it you would want to know about the developers so you guys can make an informed decision of which firm we want to go and hire to be our development partner because that's going to be an, uh, an important first step. Just to that question, um, you know, just follow what Mike just said. It, it depends on the, 
the breadth of information, you know, the, the longer, the more we ask for from them to present, the longer time they're going to need to prepare it. You know, so I think that some of it is depends on us and how we, we go about that. Also, want to clarify. I think you know this, but the, the way you asked the question was a little confusing. So I want to make sure the public was clear. We'll have we have to do a TIFF no matter what. Yes. It's just a question of when when it falls in the sequence. So just so we're clear. And I think the, the conflict is: do we get someone? get their plan and say this is what the TIF application looks like or do we have a TIF that says it's going to be these types of things and then the developer says okay that's a sure thing they've already got the TIF they've already done soil borings now we're coming in and then we'd have to I don't know, what's it called substantial change you have to then go in and re make another application not a full process but you just say okay now we have the actual thing and they approve that but the district itself can be formed ahead of time which is what we did last time. Right. Gary. Thank you. Um, so the presentation talks a little bit about the advantages and disadvantages to the city of these two different options, but what would they be, like from the developer's point of view, why would a developer prefer one or the other? Um, I mean, if a developer has the bandwidth and capacity to be getting started sooner, they might want the first one. Um, they, may, they may feel confident in the city and the state to go through and say, you know what, I'm, I, th that bit of risk doesn't bother me. I'm willing to get in early because I may have a little bit less competition because other people may not be as comfortable as I am with this process. And so they, they may want to come in at that earlier process. The, the later one, I don't see why anyone who is interested in a project of this type would not want to have everything laid out in front of them. I've got all the I's dotted, all the T's crossed. We've got the TIF district and the infrastructure and a city and a state that are willing to, to move on this. And at that point, we will also know, I didn't mention before, at that point, we'll also know what, what's happening with the legislature. So. Uh, there's a lot of conversations right now about whether properties in the growth center will be exempt from Act 250. It's a question. It is a proposal that's out there that these Tier 1A communities would be exempt. This property, if we moved it into the growth center, would then be a Tier 1A property. There's a lot of time between now and May for to see what happens with that, with that uh, current bill. But if it were adopted as it is written today, they also would not have to go through Act 250. So that would be a huge advantage for a developer who's interested in doing a project. They only have to go through the local permitting process um, in order to start moving their project forward. Lauren. Are there any other factors? So if we're looking at putting together the RFI or RFP and you know we want to be setting out the various criteria, obviously there were a lot of you know, concepts that the community and the consultant developed in terms of like number of units, multifamily versus single home combination. Um, you know, and it, I think we're just talking about phase one at this point, uh, but just like, you know, energy efficiency or other things like if we move quicker, do we kind of forego some of that and leave more to the developer to come back to us with a proposal? Or do you think it would be we'd end up with a similar kind of level of detail of, you know, this being a public project, it gives you the opportunity to really get something that benefits the public in a different way than a private development. So I don't know if my question's clear, but like, do you think it would end up with the same kind of prod product for an RFI, or would it be a kind of shorter, leaving more to the developer's discretion, potentially, if we did option one? Uh, I think you guys would be putting most of what you want in the either the RFI or RFP. And I don't know if one will be more general than the other, or if there's the same amount of specificity. We didn't do an RFI when I w worked in Barry. We just went straight to the RFP. Um, in that case, they had uh, three three requirements that council put in theirs. We wanted it to be of uh, historic character and consistent with the downtown. We want to see what you're thinking of. We don't want to see something that's really out of character. Um, it, it was going to have to be multi-story. Um, uh, that's part of, was part of the first one. It was going to have to have some public benefit was the second one and there was a third criteria that they had in there but they they pretty much had three things and then they kind of left the rest up to the developers and we had three very different looking buildings 
um, different sizes from 40,000 to 80,000 square feet. And, um, and then they had factors in it, such as your experience and your background um, in development, because they, you know, they wanted to make sure they had somebody who had the ability to build the project. We didn't want to have half a project get built and have them run out of money or financing. So we wanted to be, so we had a certain number of things, and those are the types of things you would kind of look at um, in the RFI, but mostly you'd probably go through and say, our plan called for five-story buildings. We're looking for something five-story. We're looking for something around 200 units. Um, it could be more. We're looking for um, energy efficiency, uh, affordable housing, uh, and, and you put them in there, and then you kind of leave it to the developer to come back to you and say, I can do this um, as long as I have a mix of 40% uh, affordable and 60% market rate. And then you guys have to decide, is that enough? Is that good enough? Um, and you guys just make the call on that. And then they work on the plans. It's Nothing is final until they until you sign a development agreement. And that doesn't happen after the RFP. You do the RFP, you select. They're going to do a lot of work. You guys are going to work together. In the end, we're going to reach a point where there's a development agreement that gets signed. And that's when it's like, you guys are signing on. This is good. Um, we're going to agree to these things. Um, at that point, no sewer pipes are in the ground. We're just going to be agreeing. We're going to be doing all this. We've got the TIF financing. You're agreeing to, all do, to do all this. You've got your financing, um, and here's how it's going to here's how it's going to go. And here are the protections each of us has. Tim. Yeah, so, thanks. so thinking, a couple of things. Lauren mentioned phase one, and that's what I've been thinking about too. It's really a big enough project. We really never, this isn't the master plan, although I guess you keep calling it that. But it, when Stephanie Clark left us, it was, it was a concept plan that people hit through a public process, knowing there'd be a lot more work and refining that had to happen to bring it around. So how do you feel about facing the project I mean, in, versus one developer? I, it seems like it's really big to me for any one developer, especially if it's anyone who's around here. Yeah, it's it's going to be big. I mean, we're probably looking at a Chittenden County developer. I mean, honestly, I don't know if we've got developers of this scale up here. Mm -hmm. um, certainly, people are welcome to to come up and make those proposals. Uh, it could be an out of state. There could be a New Hampshire. There could be um, you know Canadian firms. There could be other folks that might take an interest in a project of this size. My my thought when I'm talking about phase one. Um, so sometimes people have been thinking maybe it's just the first building we're building. And certainly when they build, they're going to build just the first building. Um, my suggestion to you uh, is that we try to find a developer who is going to build out the lower, call it seven or eight acres. We have 12 acres reserved, but we've got seven or eight acres. So all of those big buildings would all be built by the same person, by the same organization. Um, we're not just selling off one little piece of that lower area. They're going to take care of that whole area. That would be my recommendation. We get one builder in who can come up with a consistent uh, master plan that would say, here's how we would make 200 housing units happen down here. Um, it doesn't look exactly like you guys put in your actionable master plan, um, because here's the model that we've used in this place and that place. It looks better. We think it works better. And that's really, the, I think, the strength of getting that development partner on. That's what they do. And they so can make sure it looks just good. Just play it through a sec. Just looking at projects, because mm -hmm. probably like you, I geek out and go to <laughs> see what other people are doing. It's way bigger than what I do. But so if you go to Chittenden County and you look like Cambrian Rise, clearly big project, um, creating housing. And it's very successful. It's kind of exciting. But each piece is broken out as a separate phase by a different contractor developer. And it looks good. It has character. It's not like it doesn't look like a federal housing project where all the buildings are the same and all the windows line up the same. And it's not that one developer would end up making it look like a federal housing project, but it could. You know, if somebody just had this concept they wanted to build and build all the buildings to be similar, um, I, I think it'd be worth looking at both models because it. You know, it's just a lot of thoughts. But look at City Place. You know, you go with one developer. And look what happened there. It tanked badly. It sat for years sorting it out. And that developer was a partner with the city of Burlington. Oh, the Burlington probably yes. project, yes. Yeah. Yep. But you know, it's taken years to get a new partner in to build it. I, I think this is a multi-year project. We're building a neighborhood here, not one building. 
I, I think we should look at a phased project. And as we master plan it and plan it out, um, that might give an opportunity for some local developer, like a downstreet, to take a part where maybe they can't realistically do something bigger. Maybe they could, but um, I don't know. I'd like to at least keep the option open to phase this. And, and uh, as you all know, I've been a proponent of doing the upfront engineering and, and the homework. So I, fade. I like option two a lot better. I think it makes more sense to the way I've seen business work. Uh, I don't, I, I think the problem with the first option is you'll get tied to someone too early. You know, it's like, it's like getting married before you're ready. You know, I, I just think you really need to get the facts, kind of know what you're doing, have, have a package on the table that they can react to intelligently. And, and it will really give us more control in the process. I know there's some investment up front, but I, I really feel strongly that that's the best way to go. So. And, and certainly to follow on your, on your thought, if, if the idea was to kind of take that route, we could, in that case, when we were talking about that subdivision process, we could consider subdividing these, the lower area into two or three or four parcels, making each parcel available to a separate developer. Um, you just need to have we would probably have to have a little bit more of a conversation about what is the theme that we're going to have in here so that way we don't end up with you know, pieces that don't match. And I don't know how that one, uh, some communities, uh, certainly if you were in you know, Florida, Texas, they, they would go with form-based codes and then they would let, then, then they don't care because the separate developers all have a playbook that they have to follow. They can't go off script and make something that's not going to be consistent with the neighborhood. But we've left these rules generally open to to work with you, the city council. And they will still need DRB approval. It won't, won't be design review. So there's not the design review element. You'd probably be covering those pieces. But could we, just to that point, could we, and we haven't talked about this, but could, you know, I would assume that one of the things we could put in the request would be, you know, we'd like to see a variety of building styles. Just, you know, what would you what would you propose to give a mixed look or something like that so that it doesn't all look the same? That, yes, that. but just think about it. if you look at driving into Burlington, South, South Burlington, and you look to the left, and all the buildings that Ireland built, yeah, they all look different, but they use the same architect, and you can tell Ireland built them. You know, <laughs> it's like, or if you go to Cambrian Rise or a different project where there's more variety of, of the team, it was different architects, and yeah, they look different. But I think that makes it a more unique, interesting neighborhood to me. Mm -hmm. um, That's what I'm saying. Is we can ask yeah. for that. Right. You know, how would you achieve this variety? Mm -hmm. and have them propose to us how they would do that. So, so this is the same question that I had um, about phases. I mean, you've mentioned phases and subdivisions, and um, it's a it's a large property. So, is is this an iterative process? I mean, the the TIF extends for a certain period of time, right? Um, so you, you, one of the examples you gave was, you know, uh, separate a, a parcel, subdivide a parcel, and, and put, put an RFP out for that, for example, um, and wait and see what happened. And then if, if that works, you start to build it, and then you do it again. Is that, is that how the process goes? I mean, it seems it's, it's it's going to be iterative somehow. I doubt that anybody's going to say, yeah, we'll, we'll do the whole thing. But, uh, you know. Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, uh, certainly the, the lower area is what we're talking about, this phase one. You know, the, that, the lower eight, eight, ten acres would be the area that we're, we're talking about. Now, that could get divided up. But the idea was we would eventually need to do a phase, a phase two that would involve the upper part. I think we would be probably planning out all of this lower part in phase one. They're gonna, they may build it in four years because they're gonna build one building in one year and if it's mm -hmm. four different mm -hmm. buildings, they may break it into four different years and we're all gonna have to look at it and, and Sarah, finance director, is gonna be probably the one who's most concerned about looking at it to make sure we've got all the increment coming in that's covering all the bonds that we put out to build those $5 million. And once we've gotten enough increment, in other words, we have enough buildings built that we're generating enough tax revenue, enough water and sewer revenue, that we're now putting money in the bank. And then at what point do we move to phase two where we've got those upper hills, where again, we can talk about subdividing into big blocks of, hey, well, we're gonna sell this 10 acres or six acres, or we can go up, lay out the road, break it into 28 different lots and sell the 28 different lots 
to 28 different developers and they have a requirement that they have to meet in order to get that property. Uh, you know, you can't build a single family home. That was one of our requirements. So you have to build a uh, townhome style or it has to be this style or that style. And we would have that discussion. We can sell those off to individual builders or we can sell them all to one builder. And then we've got that second pod and that third pod. Um, so there's going to be multiple phases and it really depends how quickly this goes. This could take 20 years to fully build out. Um, so is the TIF flexible enough when you design it um, to factor in uh, phases like that over a period of time and you know which the increment will be small at first and then it will grow uh, presumably the TIF is is designed to handle that but is is the um, term of the TIF flexible or is it is it a fixed period and that's it and you've got to squeeze everything into that this this the minute details of the TIF I will leave to Stephanie to answer those questions but there is a window once you get the TIF you've got a window of five years to have your issue first your money first. spent issue your, first issue your first debt so for anyone who's in the public we can't spend any money on tiff until the public votes on it so just so everybody knows eventually that will be on the on the thing when we all say we've got our tiff approved that still doesn't mean we can spend money we have to go back we've got to get the bond mm -hmm. uh in the same way that we were talking about that with the parking garage um so there'll, there'll be that piece. So we need in five years to spend money. And then there's a window once you've spent money of a certain number of years to conclude your increment. So whether it's five or 10 years, and then you can ask for extensions if you need it. If it's a project that's taking some time. You can collect increment for 20 years. You can collect increment for 20 years. Right. But you, you only have so much years before you, you can only spend between, I think, five and 10 years. So you, could, you kind of have to do your city's work because you don't want to go too close anyway, because the, you know if you're, you don't want to out, be out spending the the TIF so district that's regardless here. Regardless of the size, of right? The project. Right. So the, you know, I mean, obviously, to the extent that we can front load as much as we can, yeah, the, the more increment you get. I mean, mm -hmm. clearly, you spend in year nineteen. Right. If you only have twenty years to do it. <laughs> you build something in year yeah, you you want we want to get as many buildings as we can, as much increment as we can, as early as we can. Just enough to sufficiently because then. Yeah, that gets us more money into into the pot, and then and we are also still looking for other funding. I mean, don't don't think that this means we're not looking for grant funds. There there are grant funds out there, especially as we start talking about how we're going to get that road across the top through Sabin's Pasture, um, because that's you know they're part of this, and we're going to count on certain amount of increment that may come from them as well, and that will be a different conversation in a different meeting. But the concept is if we're going to have a connecting road through, so that. Uh, emergency services and people who live there um, we don't need everybody going back down to route 2 to go into town if they're happen to be going out um, and can shortcut over to Barry Street or shortcut up the to College Street or East uh, East State Street and we'll have to come back with whatever plans those are but we've talked about those in the past people have asked what about connecting through to Sabins that's going to be in the discussion that would also be paid for with TIF if we get enough development on the combined increment generated on both sides. So Don, I saw your, yeah, your hand up. I want to just mention to people, this is the, uh, is the plan that's out there and it's on our page. And there was discussion way back last year before the flood about what, the, uh, what it was going to be called. And it is called the actionable plan. We decided not to call it the actionable master plan ah. because there are people who uh, thought, well, this isn't a master plan for whatever. Uh, you know, this isn't doesn't match what a master plan is supposed to be. This is the actionable plan, and this is what the council approved uh, last June. Donna, I'm going to take where Tim was and sort of leap. I don't know if you were CC'd on some of the articles that have been passed around with the image of different kind of public housing with multi-partners, not just multi-developers, but multi-finance sources. So I really like option two because I think we really need a round table with a lot of different minds around it to really, really think about it in a really broad, broad way so that we're looking not only for developers, but nonprofits and banks and realtors and state agencies and federal agencies and look everywhere for little pots of money. 
because we really want to make this more affordable in a way that's way beyond just down street. Um, so that's what I'm looking at is trying to be a little more imaginative during that time when we're working on the TIF that we're not doing, that we're making sure that we're stirring up the pot with these kind of ideas. Laura. I, I agree. I mean, I kind of feel like if we did option one, we wouldn't know what we wouldn't know about the possible developers and opportunities that we'd be foregoing. And it's, I mean, it's such a big housing opportunity for the city. We want to do it right. I do have the kind of nightmare of the Burlington City Place in my head of like we we don't want to get down a road. There, are, there are a lot of a lot of projects. You can talk to Newport. You can talk to Burlington. Yeah, there, so are, there are a lot of successes I, and a lot of failures. I would rather us be doing the due diligence and getting the best possible developers. Um, you know, single or multiple that we decide to move forward with. But you know, giving ourselves the best foot forward to have really good options seems better than just trying to do it more quickly, which seems like the benefit of option one. Yep. Pellin. Is she able to undo herself? Okay. Excuse me. You're going to be unmuted. And then we probably can stay unmuted. Okay. Okay. I'm here. Yeah. So uh, I heard like four years, right? If we choose the first plane to co um, complete the project. So um, is there any way we can talk about uh, how long will it take for each options? I am closer to the option two for all the reasons like other city councilors listed. But at the same time, I am curious about if we can talk about some kind of timeline for each option, like, oh, first option might take, I'm just making this up, like six years to complete this project. The other is takes four years, something like that. And second question uh, is, is there any way to look at how much um, residents will pay in their task? Uh, taxes to support this project in each um, option. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. So the first question on how long this would take. So uh, just talking about the preparation, um, the preparation steps that we're talking about right now, um, White and Burke put together a rough timeline of what they felt the process would take. And their option was option two, which it seems like that's where the board is kind of gravitating to. They were looking at a potential infrastructure groundbreaking in the fall of 25. So we're talking about the fall of next year. And um, so we're talking maybe, you just never know what's gonna happen, but fall, let, let's just put fall of next year or, of, or spring of 26 we would be having these projects going forward because we need, we obviously can't start the infrastructure if we don't have also somebody who's starting to build the project. Um, so it does create a little bit of financial deficit because we start spending money before we have increment coming in. That was one of the reasons we had wanted to hold a portion of the Country Club Road funding because we're gonna need a little bit of money. We will get that money back um, the TIF money will reimburse the money that you put forward at the start. So it's not money we're just losing. We just need money that we can pay the first year of the bond because we'll take out, let's say, a $5 million bond and we're going to have to make a couple hundred thousand dollar payment. Well, we already have that in the bank with the Country Club Road money. We can make those first payments. The house gets, the first project gets built. They start paying a lot in taxes and very quickly we end up back in the black. Um, so, but that's their timeline was starting in 24 that we would be targeting trying to get some work going in the fall of 25, but you know, everything, you never know what's, the, what's that thing that comes up that gets in the way. So maybe we're talking about the, the spring of 26, but that's the timeline. We're not talking about a long time. When do projects get done? Um, you know, if, 
it depends what you're kind of thinking about as the end. We could have one building open and ready to go by 27. Um, is that all the buildings in the lower area? How long does it take to build out all of the 200 housing units? I, we won't know till we have a developer in here that says, this is, you know, uh, we've got a, we've we've done our estimates. Here's the what they would call the absorption rate. We can't just build these things; they're going to be vacant. So we have to build them at a rate in which they're going to get absorbed and get filled in, and and they'll build them at a correct pace in order to make sure that as they're building them, they're filling them and not having big empty buildings. Mm -hmm. um, not that I think that would be a big thing, but that's it's their money. They're going to make sure they know they're going to have people there to fill these buildings. Um, so how long does it take to fully build out that bottom area? That could take a couple of years. Yeah. I, I'm saying I... <laughs> Independence Green Freedom Drive, 132 units. The only bigger projects in the history of this town. That was over 10 years. Murray Hill, over 10 years. And those are a third of the number of units you're talking here. You gotta also look yep. at what the market will absorb in terms of reality. Somebody can come up with an absorption rate from wherever they live, and that's a good guess, but you'll know when you build them in terms of how fast you oh, fill them, and, and that's the risk. Yeah, and that's what and that's what we'll find out, is how long does it take? It, that's really gonna be up to the developer. It's their money. They're gonna know whether this is gonna take 10 years, 20 years, five years. They're gonna be the ones who are gonna, they're gonna give you that information. I don't give you that information. What I'm saying is how do we get the developers to the door and get them started? This is what the preparation step is supposed to get us to. Uh, get us to that shovel in the ground, get us that developer, they're getting their shovel in the ground, and we're going to be ready to go. And the pace of how this implementation happens is going to be determined by the market, by our developer, by their ability to get financing. Interest rates could go up. I mean, there could be plenty of people there and they just can't get financing or uh, any number of things that could come up. But um, we'll learn that as we, as we get to those pieces. Mike, you said something about the uh, increment of... Uh of the land values, I would think, and you should correct me if I'm wrong, but once uh, once development starts, like even before there's a building on the ground, is it fair to assume that uh, a a piece a parcel that uh, has permits and has plans for uh, being developed? has a higher market value than just the 135 acres the way the, it is now has. And so does that does the increment start building up before the project is complete? Probably a Marty question. Uh, right now it's got a value of zero because we own it. Mm -hmm. So that's its market value right now, uh, or that's its, its taxable value. <laughs> So the increment will be starting at zero. That's one of the nice things about um, a project that's a municipal project is that it starts with a value of zero. So anything, when we sell increment. the parcel, I mean, the minute we sell the parcel to somebody, even if we sold it to them for a dollar, it would automatically have a value of a couple hundred thousand dollars because it's now privately owned, even if it doesn't have anything on it, and it now has increment. And that increment would go, 70% of it would go into the, into the fund. Um, and then as they build the rest of those questions, when do they start assigning tax value? That's a Marty question. He would go in and decide on April 1st, what's the value of the project and the property with mm -hmm. a foundation in the ground. But but so each, each year there, there's... Each year Marty's has, going out. It has a certain value based on what what's on the land at that point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I wanna make sure people, members of the public, Bill, it looks like you're about to say something. If no. not, no. no okay. I want sure I Donna. I guess, did you answer all of Palin's questions? Because I thought she wanted yeah, you to so compare Palin's the two options. Were about, <coughs> no, okay. Palin's questions were about the difference in the two, and I think we kind of got off into the whole project. I think the difference between the two approaches is probably two or three months. The rest of the time is going to be the time. So you know, we still have to we still have to get the growth center. We still have to get the TIF. It just might take us longer to get our development partner, and we you know then we have to do the development agreement. So once that happens, everything else moves along at the same kind of time rate. So I, it's not there's not years difference between the approaches. It's months. And then the question about how much were we going to have to pay? 
again, the project would be designed to be paid for by this tax increment financing, which would mean that it would pay for itself. We would probably have carry, I mean, we have carrying costs now, so we're paying on the bond now. We might have some upfront costs that got reimbursed through the TIF, but the, the, the idea, and I think presumably one of the things we would do, one of the things we will do, not even presumably, is to figure out how much increment we will need to cover our costs, and that would be part of the ask of the developer. You know, we need, this is the value. How would you propose to create housing that is X number of dollars worth so we know we have that amount? Uh, and and obviously, if the if that project isn't there, then we don't do it because, we, you know, unless unless we make a policy decision that we're going to pay for this because housing is worth it. But that's, a, that's not what we're talking about right now. Um, so... It, I hope I answered your question there on that. So we, we're not planning to upfront any of this or, or pay for this out of the general revenues of the city with the exception of the transition costs uh, to some to be reimbursed. Any other members of the council who want to be heard? Uh, Lauren. Mike, you mentioned, and I know you all are kind of combing for state, federal grants. I mean, just knowing that the state has committed hundreds of millions of dollars to housing in the last couple of years, it's just hard for me to believe that this couldn't get on some short list of priority projects. Like, what, do you know of any opportunities at this point or like what we could be doing to get this higher on the state's priority list? If there's some elevation, do we need a big event up there, invite the governor? Like, how do we get this on the, <laughs> on the short list? Or is it already? So a lot of the, oh, okay, I was just going to say, a lot of the funding is targeted towards affordable housing providers. So the down streets the, and, and those organizations, they, these, most of what we're talking about down here, probably beyond the scale of those um, types of entities. But what I see and what you see around the state in some of these projects is you'll end up having people that go in and partner on a project. So you'll have developer X that will come in and a percentage of the property will be affordable. So they're going to build one big building, uh, 85 units, and 30 of them are going to be affordable. So downstreet applies for the affordability funds, and those funds go into the pot, which goes into developing the project. So from a developer standpoint, they get some cost, they get some relief some help in building their project and they downstreet don't have to build the project and get a turnkey operation so it's kind of it can be a win-win but those are relationships that developers build with their partners and around the state you'll have different ones that are customarily partner with different ones and that's kind of what i would expect is that that's how those housing dollars would end up finding their way into a project like this is that it would end up being you know, buying in a percentage of affordability that's going to be managed by one of the housing partners, Ever North, Down Street, um, or the like. Um, just yeah. to add to that, though, I will say um, we got a call, you know, a couple weeks ago from the Secretary of Commerce and Community Development, and the governor does have his eye on this site and thinks it's a very viable site for development and is anxious to assist us. Uh, we've then had a follow up meeting with. Uh, Josh and Mike and I and our, she, uh, Lindsay and her staff, uh, and then I actually had a call with her today, yesterday, or today, one recently, just following up. Um, you know, we did ask them for help coming up with five million dollars for the initial infrastructure investment. They can't promise that, but they are looking for grants, and they did advise that you know we pro might want to keep the FEMA money that we had available in case we needed to match grant applications. Uh, they did point us to the Northern Borders grant and would, I think would assist us to get on the priority for that. Uh, so there's a lot of interest. We're still uh, working with them to see what help they can provide, but they are very excited and focused on this site. They actually are trying to find a way to even accelerate the timeline uh, and get some housing even sooner. And you know, we, we had to walk them and say, well, we need the growth center that your agency does. We need the TIF that your agency approves. We need permits. We need <laughs> so if you can if you can speed any of that up, great. But uh, you know, they they seem very willing to help, and uh, we're maintaining a pretty open dialogue. And she actually uh, told me it was okay for me to tell you that in public. So they, they, <laughs> well, she, you know, you great. don't want to you don't yeah. want to commit somebody to something. In the, you know, they they're not writing checks yet, but they are interested in at the table with us. So that's good. 
Okay, uh, I want to get members of the public an opportunity to be heard. I want to, uh, are we okay with uh, council members for the moment? Okay, anyone in the room who'd like to be heard on this uh, for starters? And there's also, I know, plenty of people online. Yeah, come on up. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm <laughs> my name is Jesse Harper. I'm a resident of Montpelier. Um, I guess my thought was around the question, I believe, that uh, the mayor posed around uh, folks thinking that the city is getting involved in development. I think it's probably hard for a lot of residents to distinguish infrastructure development from other parts of development. So I think probably for a lot of people that's still development. Um, so just like maybe keep that in mind that, you know, that's maybe how the public feels about that, that that's a pretty big project. Um, no, no real comment on that, just that. Thanks. And uh, actually it, it might be worth talking to CHT, Champlain Housing Trust. They're a pretty solid organization as well, not quite as local, but you know, pretty robust. And um, in Vermont Securities work with them, we found them to be just awesome. Like their staff is all kind and laid back and I don't know, uh, pretty, pretty awesome organization. And they got a ton of money from uh, Bezos' ex-wife, I forget her name. Mm, yeah, yeah. So. yeah I, I totally agree. And uh, I, I would say the same thing about Every, everyone at Downstreet Housing, you know, the, the, the scope of the projects that they're, they tend to be in are like in the dozens of units rather than hundreds of units. But, but yeah, thanks. Yeah, and we we've also worked with them too. A great organization. Yep. Um, but yeah, not not at all to the scale um, mm -hmm. that CHT is. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. So, thanks. Housing Trust. My understanding is there's some geographic division of the state. With some of these, certain ones is that have a ge they have broken up the state in certain ways, yeah. and that's how BHB money gets, uh, or um, the uh, housing conservation housing board. yeah housing conservation board how they split up their money. Um, so there there are certain regions that go in, um, but Evernorth I think covers the whole state and tends to be an umbrella organization that comes in. I was going to say that what was their name before they were Evernorth? Oh, now you're gonna do that anyway. So they were <laughs> they were actually the partner on this project at the transit center with Downstreet. They kind of took care of that for Downstreet. I mean, it turned out to be Downstreet's at the end, but they were the the people that did it. Yeah, yeah. and that so. comes into a little bit of the challenges, um, a little bit of inside baseball. So, some of the issues we've had, um, as as because we've have been talking to our housing partners about trying to do projects up here. The issue is it takes them. They have a long they kind of stack these projects of which ones they're working on and they're applying for federal funds. And so if they start going in on a separate project, they're actually competing with themselves on their own project that they've been working for years on. So that's kind of a little bit why it's like, boy, it's hard to go in because I might actually then disqualify myself from my Waterbury project that I've been working years on. And you know, we, we've got a commitment to that project and a commitment to that community. And so sometimes it, it's difficult because they end up competing with themselves. They're not competing statewide. They're competing locally on a limited share of money. So. Okay. Is there anybody else here in the room who'd like to be, has any observations or questions? Okay. And is there anyone online out there in the Zoom world who wants to click your... Uh, your raise hand function or you can raise your hand physical hand too but I'm it's I'm more likely to see it if you click the raise hand okay so it seems like we're 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 at a decision point of a couple of things one are we going to tell the city to go forward with this next uh, parcel of work, which is a lot, and two, within that, 
what do you want to hear from us about which, which option to take, option one or option two? Clarity is kind. Yes. <laughs> yeah, getting, getting clear up front uh, is what we want. Donna. Motion that we proceed with option two, and that we do the TIF first. Is there okay, any discussion? How are we going to pay for it? Because we could authorize it, but we not. There's no money in the budget for it. So how, are we just authorizing a concept tonight, or are we supposed to talk about money? There is also some money on the table with money that is in the CC. The Country Club Road mm -hmm. Project has some funds that it just got through that lease that we could then assign to cover some of this upfront until we get reimbursed. So that's part of your motion. Okay, I, I, I right. make it together. I, yeah. John, do I need to? Uh, I can make well, some big inferences there. Uh, it's be better uh, if you phrased it from. Well, I, um, I can. Uh, or, or gave me maybe a phrase it, It's to in, actually, on the uh, other agenda item, I can read it, approve advancement of the Country Club Road Project through the preparation phase and provide guidance and a lot preparation cost up front from the money in the Country Club Road Project Fund. That's good. Thank that you. That makes sense? Yes. And the guidance was option two, right? Yeah. Yeah, the option mm -hmm. two. All right. Um, are we ready to vote on this? No. Okay. Well, let's talk right, about so it then. Well, it seems like when the money came out for the country club, we got a number of letters and contacts from citizens, and it feels like at least we should have a conversation about that versus just wham, bam, this is what we did. But I don't know how you feel. But so let me address that because I, I, don't, I don't think we need to hold things up. I mean, we can hold the money up um, because in order to get to the TIF, we still have to do the zoning and the growth center, which we do not need to hire people for. Um, we'll be doing those in-house. So as Mike said, we weren't asking specifically for money. We would come back in the future with those proposals. That is, you know, as we mentioned at budget time, that is the source that we thought of. But, it, you know, if you feel it should be on an agenda, I get that. We did have a lot of concerns, and we are uh, advocating really strongly at the state level that they provide the funding that those individuals need. And so, um, you know, we certainly would like to see that happen. Um, and so uh, you don't need to commit the funds tonight. We would, what we would do with a direction to proceed would be to work on, well, first of all, then you'll take up the zoning and we'll make those decisions. Then we would work on the growth center and then we would come back and, you know, we would get proposals for the next costs and we would make a recommendation on where that money came from. If it wasn't the FEMA money, then I guess we either don't do it because we don't have the money or we have to take it from somewhere else. So. so you don't necessarily need to do that, although that if that's in your motion, you could also vote on it. So, so that's in the motion now. It's, it's in the motion now, and I'm sorry I kind of pushed you to put it in the motion now. I'm, but I'm very comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. Again, it was country club road property that was going to be leased and rented, and this is to further the use of that country club property. So I consider it's in its fund, and it's uh, only a hundred estimated up to one hundred fifty thousand k. So this seems very reasonable. Yeah, I'm a little torn here, but because um, I do think we kind of pledged to have a bigger conversation, a more in-depth conversation about how to spend that half a million dollars and um, but also if I'm understanding this right kind of the idea is that any money that we put up front we're expecting we're going to get back through the TIF process down the road at some point and so if we could I mean I know that's way down the road but <laughs> if we could earmark that and remember that that this this money came out of that 500 or so thousand dollars and that when we have that bigger conversation about what to do with that money, that we're going to remember that that is still potentially on the table. We may decide that we're not going to try to reimburse it. That it make, I mean, I think it makes sense to spend some of that money on this purpose, but we haven't really had that full conversation. Anybody else have any thoughts? I agree. 
with all of that. Really? I mean, I thought we were going to have a, a, la a larger discussion. There are other ways we can spend at least portions of that money. I would rather keep it separate. So you're suggesting you should, we should not have the funding as part of uh, Donna's motion? I am suggesting that, yes. And are you also making that motion? Oh, I can do that. Yeah, to amend. I will. Uh, I will amend to remove the, the specification on the on the funding. Okay. Is there from a the motion? Is there a second for that? Second. Do we have any discussion on that, Lauren? Yeah, and that I. I think I would rather wait and have a broader discussion about that money. Given that we don't need to make this decision tonight, I think we very well might end up saying this does make sense, um, but I do want to get kind of the update of what's happening at the State House on various possible funding sources, what money might be coming in. I know we're not going to know till a couple months still, but um, but anyway, I, yeah, I'd rather have that as a, since we don't have to, it's not going to hold anything up to not make that decision tonight, I'd rather just look at the whole pot holistically. So I would support this motion and then support Donna's motion to move forward with option two. <laughs> okay, Are we, Donna. So if we separate the money, going back to Tim's original question, then that means somehow the staff is going to take out some of that potential advancement. If they're moving on option two, what direction are we allowing them to move on with this motion without any funds attached to it? Well, um, like I just said, we would complete the zoning, which we're doing now. We would get to work on the, master, on the uh, growth center application. That all takes a period of time, and we would probably seek proposals for the actual costs for the work, and then we would have to come back and say, which we would do anyway, you'd have to approve those anyway. I mean, you wouldn't be spending that money tonight, and we'd come back and say, okay, well, now we're ready to do TIF. It's going to cost $50,000 for the TIF application. Will you approve that, and from which source? And likewise, if we do engineering work and all that stuff, we would have to come back to you and say, we're retaining an engineer for this due diligence work and it's going to cost money and you know I mean Tim's right that there's no money in the budget and, and as we've said when we presented the budget there was no money in the budget our anticipation was to use the FEMA lease money so uh, obviously that money can be used for any number of things and you know call it 150,000 if we use that you know we, we will have to then take it from someplace else or not do it that's those are the choices. So those earlier steps of completing the zoning, completing the uh, growth center designation, waiting for that to be uh, approved, that probably gets us into, what, May, June? Yeah, I mean, we, we should have, if everything goes well, we'll have the zoning done at the end of the month. Um, mm -hmm. We would then be in a position where we could start developing the growth center expansion application. And so I would be hoping we would be by the end of the fiscal year, you know, we'd be looking at June, July, that we'd be yeah. able to have that approval done. I don't know their schedule, but. Because once we do it, then it's a couple months at the state, too, so. Oh, so, yes. so we're not really risking anything. We're, we're not holding you up by taking the money out tonight. Yeah, no, and that was why we didn't put the money in as the request. Our first step was really to go through and say, give us direction. Make sure we're all moving forward. Let's get a direction, and then we can start going. Obviously, if the decision was we want to get an RFI out early, then we would probably be coming back fairly quickly to go through and say, all right, we're going to need a consultant because we don't do that. We're going to have to come in, get an RFP to get a consultant to do our RFI. Um, and that would take some time. But now this is fine, but at some point we're going to recognize, and we just wanted to make sure we put that number out there. That was the number from White and Burke that they felt about 150000 for us to get through this next year and a half and so we should just have that in the back of our minds we're going to probably coming back for some requests at some point that are going to total in that area okay. Fifty-five thousand is about the estimate for the tiff application okay donna okay but if you don't come back until let's say may or june the tiff has to be ready for the legislative session no no doesn't it no no the no, the this tiff is all through the agency. tiff tiff is all through the agency that the, okay the, um great the, no We've been seeking different legislation on TIF, but the TIF program exists, and there are there are still there's a limited number of TIFs, but I think there are at least still two or three available, um, and nobody no active applicants. So we would be seeking to slot into one of those, and it's an application process to the Vermont Economic Progress Council, VEPSI, 
And again, that takes two or three months because they look at it, they review it, they do a site visit. That, that they, was my concern. Yeah, how long it yeah. Be we don't. We we right. But that's going to be the case no matter what, and we're not dependent on the legislature. But we do need to, to get to the TIF sooner yes. than later. Okay. Mm -hmm. But we can't. But we can yeah, until fine. the growth center's done. Okay. Okay. The motion before us now is to amend Donna's motion. <laughs> I think we're. I feel like we're ready for that vote. Um, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, great. <laughs> now we're on to Donna's motion. Do we have any more discussion of that? <laughs> All those in favor of Donna's motion to approve going forward uh, as proposed with option two, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, great. It, this is really exciting. I've been really looking forward to this meeting to see the next concrete step. So, so thank you. And you know, it is eight o'clock. Usually, we would take a break at eight thirty, but experience teaches us that uh, <laughs> a first public hearing on a zoning set of zoning amendments tends to take a long time. So, I'm going to take our break now. And so, back in ten minutes. Back to order, and we are ready to go um, with uh, more zoning, more, more, still more time for Mike Miller in the spotlight. Yes, still Mike Miller, still planning director. So, um, and this is the second of three. He'll get me one more time here. So, uh, I'm going to go through a quick presentation on the amendments to the zoning and river heads regulations. This is is a public hearing, and I will. Uh, call the public hearing, uh, or I'll commence the public hearing. Okay, so uh, quickly what I'm going to go through, I'm going to go through the process of what we're talking about tonight, uh, where to find the proposals if you're still looking for them, uh, describe the changes in the Unified Development Regulations, and which is also known as the zoning bylaws, most people call them zoning bylaws, and then describe the river hazard area amendments as well, and then what are the next steps, and then we'll jump into some questions and comments. So the process, <clears throat> this is two hearings over two nights. So uh, tonight we're having the first hearing. Each hearing is gonna cover amendments to two sets of regulations, just so we're making sure we're covering all of our legal bases. These are actually, it's, we're calling it one hearing, it's really two hearings at the same time to look at the zoning and the river hazard area regulations. And we are required under state law to have two hearings. So we will have a meeting tonight, a hearing tonight on the 14th, and a second one on February 28th. The council can have additional hearings if they choose. So if at the end of the 28th, uh, you guys are not ready to approve or make changes. You're welcome to warn another hearing or add, just continue to another date certain, and we will just continue having hearings. Uh, so where to find the proposals? If you're looking for it, you can go to the city's website on the main page, and you'll scroll down to what are called popular links, and on the right-hand side, you'll see zoning and floodplain regulations. Uh, we were kind of hoping it would say draft, but we didn't have enough letters, so that's where the drafts are. If you click on it, you will get to here, and right on the top are the draft zoning and river hazard regulations. And we've got both of those, plus the draft zoning map. And if you're just looking for a list of what the changes are, there's an Excel table on the list of zoning changes that has a list of about 99 changes. Most of them we made. You'll see notes in them. If there's something that's grayed out, it's because the Planning Commission opted not to make those changes. So I'm going to quickly go through the, the zoning map changes. Uh, we have, uh, so periodically we get requests from property owners and developers who will come in and say, uh, for various reasons, uh, this needs to get adjusted. In this case, this is uh, 155 Northfield Street. It is a property, some of you might know, it's a, it's a daycare facility. And it used to be part of National Life. National Life subdivided it and sold it off. And so it is currently included in Western Gateway where that use is a conditional use. And they really are, they front on Northfield Street. It makes sense for them to be in Northfield Street. So they asked to be moved to Northfield Street and they are now in a different zoning district. Uh, we're also gonna talk about some country club road changes to accommodate the redevelopment that we were just talking about. We'll have a 
very tiny change on 29 Sibley Street. It was a parcel that was purchased and merged, and uh, we just need to clean up the map there. And then there's a set of Home Act changes. Last year, Act 47, the legislature made a number of changes that required any uh, areas that have sewer and water to be zoned at a density that has at least five units an acre. And for the most part, we met all the requirements of the Home Act, uh, with the exception of the Town Hill neighborhood, and we will talk about that. So uh, this is the proposal um, on the left for Country Club Road. It's a little hard because this is just zooming in onto a zoning map. If you see the number two, the route two sign, that is the roundabout. And then the gray line coming out, moving to moving down is route two. And then uh, so Agway would be at the bottom of the, the road. You'd make the left and go up into Country Club. So 1-4 is really the area where the Country Club is, the two parking areas, and a lot of the lower flat areas where you have some recreation fields. And we've proposed making that Urban Center 1. It is the most flexible zoning district and we felt would be most appropriate if we're going to be going out to bid to get developer interest that we give the most flexibility to any proposal that might be coming in. We will probably eventually in the future be adjusting the zoning to more better reflect what ends up being decided, but we wanted to open it up and make it the most flexible possible and not restrict what options we might see from a developer. So that's just the proposal. Um, above that, those are the also all areas 9-9, -9, that is a uh, residential 3000, so that is reflecting the uh, actionable plan uh, and what was proposed for the townhouses in the open area. So everything that you see that's the dark green on the left and the right of it, those are areas that uh, are too steep and are forested. If you were, so if you're walking around on the country club site and you're not in the woods, you're in either 1-4 or 9-9. Uh, on the right-hand side, that's the Sibley parcel. It's a little teeny tiny piece of a parcel that, that the adjustment was made. And uh, the last two changes are, uh, this is the Town Hill. So we have shifted that. It used to be called residential 24,000, which meant it was one unit per 24,000. It is now gonna be one unit per 9,000 consistent with state law. And then there was also a little piece of residential 24 that was in Sabin's pasture. Uh, that's a little piece of land that was owned by Casey Ellison. Um, her parcel is split into three different zones and has riverfront res 24 and then mixed use residential above it. That middle piece will now be res nine. So other home act changes within the text. Um, so within the text, we made the maps changes. We now have to make those other changes to the text itself to reflect those. Um, so we rezone those, move those neighborhoods into residential 9,000. We also needed to change the density of residential 9,000. So our densities and units are all based on residential 9,000. If you're in that neighborhood, that means you have a minimum lot size of 9,000 square feet. You also have a density of one unit per 9,000. To be consistent with the new state law Home Act, a fifth of an acre is 8,712 square feet. So residential 9,000, we're not changing the name, it's still gonna be residential 9,000, but the density will be one unit per 8,712. Uh, housing and density. Uh, so the Planning Commission, uh, and this has come up a couple times, has made wanted to come up and make proposals to make housing, um, to remove barriers to more housing being developed. So um, this is a list of changes that Planning Commission is proposing to help to free up some and make, make housing easier to get permitted. So figure 214, that's the use table, uh, adds large and small multifamily. Currently we just have everything labeled multifamily. And so in this case, we've split off small multifamily, which would be from five to 14 as one use and 15 and more as another use. Uh, and that would allow us to have multifamily as a permitted use in a few more zoning districts, uh, the small multifamily. Um, we added more types of congregate housing. So we have two types of housing. You have dwelling units where you have all the requirements of housing, all five requirements of a housing, um, you know, kitchen, living room, bathroom. Um, congregate housing 
you share one of those required elements. So you might be in um, co-housing where uh, everybody has their own rooms in their own bathrooms, but you share a kitchen. Um, and so there are v different housing options that exist. Um, and sometimes, I mean, the classic one would be living in a dorm and eating at the cafeteria. Um, that's congregate housing. So adding more types of congregate housing instead of just one uh, just allows it to better match with some of the dwelling units types. So they, they added some clarification there. Section 3002, this is a policy recommendation. Um, again, these are all policy things we can discuss. We, in 2018, we had a proposal that said, regardless of density, if you have a single family home on a conforming lot with sewer and water, which most properties do, uh, you can have a duplex regardless of density. You can already have an accessory apartment, you can have a duplex. What they want to do is to expand that right to go up to four units. So if you have a conforming lot in the city and you're on sewer and water, you can have up to four units regardless of the density. So if you're in residential 9,000 and you have a 9,000 square foot lot, you could put a, a, a four unit building on it. Um, and that's just, uh, you still have to meet other requirements, still have to meet your parking requirements and all the other design requirements. Uh, but there are a number of projects that um, would be opened up if there was a little bit more uh, ability to allow some of these uh, larger or small multifamily, these quadplexes, triplexes. So that was a proposal they put in there. And the other big policy recommendation, we had this conversation the last time we had a proposal, which was to try to remove the density from some additional areas of town. Uh, one of the things that came out of a report by AARP was that, you know, you, you really have to make sure you have good design reviews if you're going to not have the density regulations. So their proposal is any parcel in the design review district, and we believe we have pretty good design review rules, uh, if you're in the design review, you will not have a maximum residential density. Um, currently, Urban Center 1 Urban Center 2, Urban Center 3, the urban centers don't have any residential densities. You can fit as many units as you can in the buildings that are there. You don't, there is no maximum residential unit number. This would simply expand that to include other areas of the design review district. Mike, could you remind us what that area is? What? That area, uh, it, it looks big on the map because it, it expands up to National Life, uh, comes down and covers the areas around the high school in Western Gateway comes across the um, the Capitol Complex, kind of goes out, I think, as far as maybe the, um, is it the middle school or elementary school? The one on Main Street, Main Street Middle School. Uh, so it kind of goes out that far. I believe it's on, I know it's on St. Paul. I don't know if it extends to Loomis. So it's kind of in that <coughs> in that area, um, and it goes part way down Berry Street. Thanks. It's also around Vermont College, right? And it is around Vermont College. Yes, there is an island around Vermont College. Is there, is there maps online? The maps are online, so you can, we can find it. Yes. Uh, so the second major change we made some major changes to the demolition provisions. Uh, we had a recent court case, and so we learned a, um, a bunch from how the judge interpreted our rules. And it wasn't bad. We, it came out the same way we did. He just used different, uh, came through a different theory. Um, so we thought we would clean up the demolition rules. Um, that has also been an area of concern. People in the past have said our concern about removing residential densities is that people are going to come in and demolish buildings and replace them with these big box, ugly boxes. Um, so tightening up and making better, more defendable demolition provisions will help relieve some of those concerns. Can you explain that now? Uh, I can get into some of those details now. I might need a little bit of light, but we could get into the demolition rules. Is there a specific question you had on that, or did you want me just to... Highlight the changes, please. Yeah. All right. So 
So for anyone following along at home, it's this is 3004. to go through and refresh all my memory on all the details we made. So we made substantial changes to this one. Um, so one change that we had early, the, the other addition that was written, it wasn't clear if demolition applied only in the design review historic district or if it applied in everything. Um, in this case, we've clarified that it does uh, apply everywhere, but that there are different rules um, when it comes to demolishing a historic building or part of a historic building. So the rules for demolishing a non-historic building are relatively straightforward and simple. Um, you just need to, let me see, all structural debris must be removed and must be restored to natural grade and ground cover shall be reestablished unless otherwise specified as a condition of the development review board. So we're pretty clear if it's not historic, um, you're pretty flexible to be able to go and remove a structure and work on replacing it. Um, the, room, the demolition of historic structures was a much more complex uh, set of rules. And so what it wasn't entirely clear, I'm trying to look through the, how, how they had formulated it. There was an undue financial hardship piece uh, unless it, the project could be found to have a substantial benefit to the community. So those were really, in the past, those were like kind of like the two things. You either had to prove one or the other. And so we kind of went through and broke it into a couple more pieces that really looked more at um, putting a requirement of the requirements the application shall demonstrate one or more of the following. The application meets the standards of two, showing no historic uh, loss of historic integrity, or it doesn't have a historic integrity. The application meets three, showing that it retains the historic structure, that retaining the historic structure is not economically viable, or the application meets the standards in four that shows the project provides public benefit exceeding the historic loss. So we've kind of gone through and broken into three different pieces. And rather than having, there were some rules for the income piece, and we've kept those income pieces. We've just been clearer about what are the rules of um, showing there's no historic integrity. And this was actually part of our court case. Um, just because something old doesn't mean it's historic has historic integrity and that that was that was what went to the case in court was that there was uh, a historic historic barn in a backyard with a shed dormer off the back and they wanted to remove the shed dormer and then move the historic barn and renovate it and the question was and it was appealed as to whether or not they had the right to demolish that that shed dormer off the back and it was just like you know and we had historic reviews that came in and said there's no historic significance to that, but we really didn't have a good set of rules that said, yes, that's okay to remove that and here's the process. So we just needed to have much, a much clearer set of guidelines as to when this has no historic integrity and therefore can be removed. Um, and the case of comparing the value of the property to the public benefit of the of the project. So we just needed to kind of add a little bit more t bite to it to make sure that as we review it, we have a little bit more that we can, um, we can rely on in the review. And without, I think, going through line by line, um, that's, that's the big picture of what we were looking for it was more of the economic, and, and it was more of talking about economic viability as opposed to the hardship of the owner. Um, kind of changing the dynamic a little bit because we really need to be equitable about, um, these are land use regulations and um, I can't hold you to a higher standard in zoning just because you might have more money than your neighbor does. It, you should all be treated equally under the law. so. The standard really should be about the economic viability of the property and not the ability of the property owner, their ability to, 
to do something. So that was a little, it's a subtle, but it, th that was a little bit of what the distinction was we were trying to work for is show us how the project itself isn't economically viable and therefore it needs to be demolished as opposed to, well, you're a wealthy business owner from Burlington, you can afford to fix it up. But, uh, you know, if it was a homeowner, we, would, we wouldn't make him fix it up. So those are a couple of the pieces that kind of get to some of it. And I'd be happy to, to answer questions. I, I would need a little bit more time to dig back into the, the details of that one. That was a change we made before the flood. These were ready to go before the flood, and we just had to kind of table them for a bit. So a couple of them are not as fresh in my mind as <laughs> I'd like to flip them off uh, the answers. But that's what the, that's the, the big picture of where that one was going. Um, the next section of the major changes to sign rules, this really has been an issue going all the way back to 2018. Um, when we made the big zoning changes, we kind of took what our consultant gave us and we recognized there are a bunch of issues with this and we're just going to live with them. And we've lived with them about as long as we can live with them. Um, this really came to a head with uh, a proposal from National Life. They want to have um, a sign at the bottom of the hill, and we just can't approve the sign. It's it, The only allowance they have is for like six square feet. And we're like, that just doesn't make any sense. The, the rules don't make any sense, the sizes that are in our rules. So most of the changes that are in here really are looking at the sizes, the heights. Um, uh, we, we do put in there a prohibition on which we, I think we currently already have, but it just clarifies the no internally illuminated signs. Um, but a lot of this came, I went through and literally drove around and took measurements of the downtown signs, the, the River Street signs, how tall, do, how tall are they, how big are they, and got a sense of what they were so that way we could put in here some more reasonable signs that would go through and say, this is what we see. I haven't heard a lot of complaints. Um, you know, we might go through and say, this, this sign is too big. We have a couple of them in there that are too big. We're not going to let that one. But these all seem reasonable. This is the existing size of signs that we see here. These are going to be fine. Um, and then really started to address how we, which signs, how we measure them. So we classified them differently. What we will be doing going forward is whether you're a wall sign, so you're parallel to the roadway, or you perpendicular to the roadway like a... Um, a pole sign or a projecting sign because as you're traveling signs that are perpendicular to you need to be bigger or parallel to you need to be bigger than perpendicular to you it's just and the higher the speed limits you are the bigger a sign has to be they don't have to be a lot bigger but they do have to be a little bit bigger so if you're driving at 25 miles an hour signs can be smaller because you have a easier time of reading them at those speeds and it just goes back to how the signs sign companies have these rules wasn't there a bit of a argument about the method of measuring the signs for the dunkin donuts or the dominoes Do uh, domino's the pizza <laughs> years ago there was there was no conf um issue with uh that was just a mistake that we made in in the office um okay. it was a it was a quick thing it was our mistake when we did it um, the way the rules were written, it was each side of the sign counts as a sign. So when they came in and said, you know, let's say it was an 8 by 10 sign, we said, oh, that's 80 square feet, that meets the rules. But actually that's 80 square feet on this side and 80 square feet on that side, so that would have been 160 square feet, it's too big. <laughs> I think those numbers aren't, aren't right. It's, the Domino's was much bigger. So Domino's got a sign that was basically double the size they were supposed to because you just look at the sign, you multiply it out, you look at the chart, you're like, yep, that meets the rules. But then there's a provision that says, well, if it's a two-sided sign, you have to count both sides. We tried to set up the rules so we don't have that. <laughs> it doesn't lend itself to that mistake. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, um, Excellent. So a lot of this, um, like I said, these are – just the rules that we had in place were had, had been problematic and we just needed to, to get them cleaned up. So that's what you see with the, the, the sign rules. Um, 
removing solar access and shading requirements. This was a proposal that was pitched last time and didn't quite make it through, and they thought they would put it back in for consideration again. Uh, this was put in again 2018, um, and at the time we didn't really realize there isn't really a thing called, um, uh, there's a legal premise that they're basically saying, you know, you, they're, they're, you, nobody has a right to solar, to, to solar access. It's, it's a right that doesn't really exist, and so here we were actually giving a right that technically doesn't exist. And it becomes a problem because it's really easy to shade the way the rules are written. You can't shade roofs, walls, or yards. And the definition of yard is your setback area. So you can't even shade your neighbor's lawn next to. <laughs> so it was kind of like, wow, that's really quite the rule. So we came up with some proposals last time that said, well, maybe it's just existing solar projects. Maybe it's um, existing and proposed. Um, but in the end, the Planning Commission voted to just say, let's remove these requirements altogether. We have a funky town with the hills and the steep and more solar projects are blocked by trees than buildings. And there's nothing we can do about the trees. So we, their recommendation was just to remove these requirements. They're really, most, most people already shade their neighbors and to have rules that say no new buildings can shade their neighbors just means we're not gonna get very many new buildings. So that's their proposal. Uh, and I support that proposal. Um, section 3510, remove boundary adjustments and move them out of 350 to 3125. That just makes it administrative. Under state law, if something's a subdivision, it has to go through a subdivision process. But if somebody just wants to clear up a boundary line with their neighbor and make a boundary line adjustment, they shouldn't have to have this big, long, months-long project. We can do it as administrative permit. Uh, 3126 makes permanent the interim in emergency housing provisions. You guys adopted emergency housing provisions as an interim measure. This makes them permanent. We made a bunch of other typos and technical corrections, which we do every time as we're working on the documents. We'll find our typos, miss references. You know, it'll reference 4302 and it should be 4303. We, we just highlight them and we put them in a list and we fix them. Uh, and we have three additional changes. Um, 2107B, I think I mentioned this, and I can put these in the document if you guys just go through and say, yes, do it. Um, for some reason, we said former, uh, the former um, CCV building on Elm Street. And it's not a former building, it's an actual building. So we need to just strike the former. Uh, the second change was, uh, remember I referenced that um, within the, um, design review area would be exempt from zoning, uh, would be exempt from density requirements. If we did that, we also have to add the words capital complex because technically the capital complex is not in our design review district and there are eight private properties in the capital complex that should also receive that benefit because they do get design review. And the last... Before yep. we go past this too far, your presentation says make permanent the interim interim emergency housing provisions of 3126 and it looks like it's actually 3125. That's because when you delete the one section before it that one gets moved or something like that. There's uh -huh. it's it's a it has to do with the reference number of there's a provision oh because the boundary line adjustment gets added to 3125, pushing the existing pushing. 3125 to 3126. Gotcha. Um, and the last recommendation we have is to 4204, which really is looking at some delayed projects. Uh, we had a number of projects that had been proposed during COVID or at the start of COVID. The permits are still valid, but under the current zoning, you have to complete your project within two years. What we've proposed in these regulations is to change that to say, once we, you get an approved project, you have two years to commence your project and then two years to finish it. Most towns have it that way. It's just because we might approve a project and then you have to go through Act 250. It might take you 18 months to get through Act 250. You're not gonna be done with your project in six months. So putting that in there to go through and say, here's your window, time to work. That's in there for this 4204 proposal, what we want to be able to do is to allow a reset of any valid permit 
um, because we had a lot of projects during COVID that kind of came to a stop because they're just like, we, we, we're, we can't do anything until this gets resolved. As soon as we get that resolved, we get hit with a flood. And now they're like, uh, you know, now I got to go back through the process. So we're hoping we would just put in here a one-time thing that said anyone who's got a project that was approved after a certain date, if it's still a valid permit, we're going to give you another year to commence your development because we've already reviewed your project. It's already been approved. We just want to go and give you a little bit more window and then you'll work within this existing window of you'll have two years to commence your project and two years to complete it. So that's just a suggestion I had because it was more than one project that we had people coming in and saying we'd really like to be able to go and take advantage of the permit we had approval for and we're limited we can only give one extension and some of these guys have already run out of their extensions the river hazard changes are really short really quick um, what, there's a federal recommendation that it's not a requirement it's a recommendation that critical facilities be required to be elevated to the 500 year floodplain so your critical facilities are things you'd expect your your fire stations police stations and these other things obviously we have a number that are in here but if you built a new one you would have to build to uh, above two feet above the 500 year instead of two feet above the 100 year floodplain and there are other private I'll call them private um, not public facilities that qualify as critical facilities your hospitals your uh, nursing homes uh, certain facilities like that and usually what we're talking about these are facilities where we would not want to be in a position where we have to evacuate them um, we really want to put them in a place where it is the least likely that we're going to be in a position think of an ice jam coming in and starting to flood your elementary school you obviously would not want that situation to happen because you don't want to be trying to get moving children or um, disabled where, where people for example the 500 <laughs> so five 500 year floodplain mm -hmm. in montpelier so it varies because as a as a river narrows the the the, the 500 year is going to be higher and as it's wider it's going to be lower but in general are in for montpelier you're talking about a foot higher than the 100 year so for the most part if you're two feet above the 100 year floodplain you're already above the the 500 but um, the 500 year floodplain is also bigger horizontally. So obviously the 100 year floodplain is here. City Hall is in the 100 year floodplain. The police station is in the 500 year floodplain. And there's a line in between. <laughs> so uh, obviously there's a slight areas where things get, get added in. It's just a recommendation that they have to elevate above the 500 year for critical facility, mostly because we're talking, we're talking critical facilities, we're talking about the, those folks that we do not want to have to move a whole bunch of them really, really fast. So, uh, you know, nursing homes or level one nursing homes, uh, you know, uh, schools, those types of facilities. Um, and there's a list and the way they recommend it is to have what they call class, class, class three and four critical facilities something like that in our building code. So it's a building code. We can go right to the state building code and say, if you're one of these categories, you're in and you should be elevated higher. Um, and then we made a few, like two minor technical changes. So next steps, how, how we review is up to council. We can walk through line by line. We can start uh, with this summary and take questions. Um, the entire zoning and river hazard areas is open to change. So if there are other things that are in the regulations that you know about, just for purposes of conversation we can have conversations um, but if you make any substantial changes it must go back to the Planning Commission for comments not their approval they will provide comments and give them to you as to what their thoughts are uh, and I will take any questions okay thanks since this is a public hearing I want to start by uh, opening up to questions and comments from the public I think I said Dan Thank you. Dan Jones, Northfield Street. Um, I'll be very brief. 
I want to compliment you, uh, Mike, and the Planning Commission on the increase in density proposals. Uh, I think that's been long needed in town, and I think it is one of the things that I would hope the council would move on. The only thing I was sorry not to see because of uh, recent problems is uh, we still have parking minimums in town, and I really would like to see us consider getting rid of the parking minimums downtown uh, because it will allow for development in areas that the state may be vacating but do not have parking attached to them. So I would like to encourage that as being considered as part of this. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dan. Uh, Linda Berger. You'll need to be allowed to be unmuted and then. Oh, sorry. I guess you know the drill by now. <laughs> Not yet. Here, thank you. Hi. You? <laughs> thank you very much. Um, I'm from District 1. I live on um, Lower State Street, directly on the river. And I'm wondering <laughs> about, pardon? I, I know your name is on the screen, but could you start by telling, saying your name? Okay, sorry. I'm Linda Berger. I thought I said it. I'm Linda Berger. I live in District 1 on the river, Lower State Street. Um, the difference between the riverbed and the banks have changed dramatically after the July flooding. So I'm wondering how that is being factored into the designation of the different floodplains. So um, at this point, we don't have any new zoning or any new floodplain maps that are coming out. The state, it is something that the state works on, and they have folks that are working on mapping. I don't know if it will take into account this flood event because they actually started working on it before this flood. Um, but there's a meeting either tomorrow or Friday that one of my staff members will be going, uh, that they'll be attending to, to go and see the status of those flood maps. Um, and we will continue to look over the next year um, and get input from the um, Resiliency Commission to, to see what recommendations they have for making other changes. These changes were all proposed before the flood and were just held up waiting for us to get some time to, to actually bring them to Council. So we don't have any new changes um, based on what happened in the flood, so we will be certainly going back and reviewing as we as we move forward um with the exception of one change i think we propose to take out a requirement for a prohibition against sheetrock in the below the flood stage um, and that's just because it's the easiest way to remove and put them back in um, so that's why we've we've changed that provision but other than that we haven't made any provision based on what happened in the flood can i can i, can I make an additional comment would that sure. be all right yeah i mean Recently, there was flooding on Lower State Street again with very minimal rain. So I feel like there's some urgency here. Is so it's just it, uh, is there a feeling of urgency or it's just okay to let the process go the way it is, and that's probably all you can do in terms of the structure of the state and the city. Um, I guess the way I would answer that is there, there are going to be a couple of different processes. The the river regulations are what governs how people build their houses or businesses um, in the floodplain. Uh, so we're really looking at the properties. Those, I think what you're referring to are kind of those improvements that need to be made um, to the floodplain itself. Maybe uh, culverts need to be made bigger or uh, things need to be cleaned out or riverbanks need to be reinforced. And those aren't going to be a part of the river hazard regulations, but that's certainly part of floodplain management. And the city and state are looking at a number of things. I know the Resiliency Commission very much is going to be looking at what are the best ways to move forward to improve how the floodplain functions and makes it work better. And that's going to be a process that'll be separate from the river hazard regulations. This is really looking at, um, you know, I want to put an addition on my house and I'll tell you how high you have to put your, your addition or uh, those types of questions. Um, but there's certainly work that needs to be done to make sure that, you know, maybe a culvert under State Street um, maybe it's undersized and it needs to be resized. Well, we'll have to go and those are going to be all on a list of things that we have to work on over the next couple of years. Uh, and I don't have a schedule of that. Thank you. 
Thanks, uh, Rebecca. Oh, Rebecca Copans. Hi, thank you for having um, this conversation. I just want to really um, thank the the Planning Commission for their work on the zoning changes. I feel like this is one of the most profound um, immediate efforts that we can do to improve housing in Montpelier. And I just want to um, quickly just weigh in and say thank you for this work. And I fully support um, these efforts, especially the density, the changes in density. So thank you to everyone, and I, I hope you move them forward. I, I was going to be required to have one parking space for each apartment. I was hoping to put seven apartments in that building. Uh, density requirements were applied to that building, uh, which interestingly, I, when I looked at the map, I thought it was in the Capitol complex. So it would have been, uh, would not be have any density requirements. But then it was pointed out to me that in fact it was, well, they didn't use the word gerrymandered, but that building has been gerrymandered. So it was in the Redstone neighborhood, which is kind of across this across the other side of Bailey. So here I was ready to buy a government building that was for sale, turn it to seven apartments. And I just could not do it. Um, so here's my point. It's not just a matter of making zoning changes. I applaud the zoning changes. One of the things that I think we really have to be thinking about is giving the department more administrative flexibility to say, oh, this doesn't make any sense. Yes, you can do that. We can help you figure out how you, you don't have to have parking places where, where it's impossible. We can figure, oh, you're right. That, really, that building should have been in the Capitol complex. Now, we're going to do, we're going to waive it. Instead, there's a long process of going before the DRB, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Uh, similarly, um, one of the problems that I have run into several times is that planning and community development means working with developers, not with individual homeowners and property owners who might be able to do some development themselves. Uh, the whole idea of passing uh, uh, ADU laws and duplexing and so forth was to give individuals, particularly seniors like myself, an opportunity to move out of our giant homes, divide them up in some way, um, and, and, and really increase housing internally, in, in, uh, 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 not, not to bring in developers to develop brand new uh, parcels. I'm not against that, but I think that the, the, that the uh, planning office needs to work much more with individuals. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Um, Jesse. Everyone, uh, Jesse Harper again. Um, so uh, there was something being said there about, um, I think, flexibility in planning, and that's something I also agree with. Uh, sometimes things just don't make sense, and uh, it seems like there's a sensible way through that, but, you know, for whatever reason, that's not possible. Um, I'd like to take an example here. I, I have, uh, this is about the sign topic. Um, is it okay if I pass these around for sure. you to look at? Thanks. Mm -hmm. 
so in in the first picture we see uh the existing golf sign that's still there the the golf part is gone uh but the existing structure of that sign is there um you know I, i'm like a collector of like vw's and m very many things old right if it strikes my fancy i'm like oh that's cool i'm into it um this is like sort of a piece of transportation history uh it's pretty old um you know and, and I, th I just think it's really cool and i'd like to see it repurposed um and i'd like to move that sign from where it is and i have permission of the owner tom lazon to move it um, and I'd like, I think it fits really nicely with the Graham Central logo. The actual shape of the sign is, is a perfect fit. Uh, Graham Central also has several nods to transportation, like uh, the tube in London and obviously uh, Graham Central Station in New York. Um, and so when I went to planning, it, you know, it was like, well, you know, it has to be a 12 foot sign max now because you're moving it. Um, and... Uh, it's not historical anymore because you're moving it. And I just think the thing's beautiful. It's a nice piece of our history, and I'm trying to save it and kind of give it new life. And so I think that's like a good example of uh, what the gentleman on uh, the web was saying, that you know we need planning and administrative to have a little bit of flexibility. Uh, we obviously don't want things being abused and stuff like that, but... Uh, that's my request and just bringing it out into the open that um, there's a pretty good example here, I feel like, of something that's sort of stringent but not, you know, making that not possible. And so I guess I'm here requesting a variance, a waiver, a discussion about this so that as we uh, – I just came in the other day just to ask about this sign and then heard that there was going to be some discussion here. And I was like, oh, okay, I'll show up. Um, so yeah, so those are the renders of what we could do. You'll also notice that there's a yellow mast sign that was part of the Spooner Specialty Tools and probably before that, the um, mm -hmm. the oil company that was there. Uh, quite a bit of history in this building as well. Um, and that sign is well above you know the 12 feet existing. Um, I don't need two signs. I'm game to take down the big tall yellow one and put up the cool white one once I spend significant amounts of money refurbishing it and making it have new life. Um, but that, that's my request. And, and when I kind of drove in, I, I did very little preparation for this, to be clear. Um, when I drove back after printing these at the office at Vermont Security, I, I was looking at signs as I drove in. And this, a sign of this size does not feel out of place in that district or that road okay thank so. jesse thank you yes. uh, obviously the city council doesn't have the ability to take up a, a variance request but but i'll ask uh mike is this something that could be a, a, a variance could be requested for something like this uh it's not i was trying to go through and see where so in general what we have is um so zoning administrators are required to literally enforce the zoning regulations that is in statute that we have to do that so what we set up uh is our rules that pretty quickly go through and say these are the things and we try to go and make sure these are the things we want to see happen and if you do what we all want to have happen, we can administri in administratively issue your permits. So that's generally how the rules are set up. So uh, if you need to meet the parking, or if, if you meet one parking space per dwelling unit, we can issue the permit. Now, it doesn't say you can't. It just says you need to go to the DRB uh, if you want flexibility because zoning administrators can't have the flexibility. We could... I mean, I'd have to see, first of all, the height of this sign. I don't have any information on how tall the, the existing sign is, so we'd have to go through and do some work. And I'd have to work with Meredith to go through and do some additional look at where things are to see what the rules are and how difficult it would be for him to meet the requirement. Um, is it something that this, the sign base could be 
uh, lowered or cut down or buried underground slightly to bring that height down. We we usually work with people to go through and try to see how we can make this project meet the requirements. There's generally a, a rule for why. Once you're above 12 feet and you're traveling on a road, that sign is significantly above the, the height of the, the traveling public to be able to view it. Uh, it's already intentionally trying to get people who are farther away. Uh, you know, it's why you know, you'll see big giant signs so you can see them from the highway. It's not meant for the people who are on the road. They're trying to get it out to the highway. So usually that's what the 12 foot height is, is really to make sure the height of the sign is matching with the roadway so people in their vehicles can actually see the sign at the reasonable speed in the reasonable way. But we can, we can look at these before the next meeting and come back and give you some four examples, as you said, you're not going to be approving this, this is going to go to the Planning Commission, or this is going to go to the DRB, or this is going to go administratively. Uh, and we can say this, this project currently would not meet these rules, and you guys would have the right to say, we think these types of projects should, let's change the rules, then it's not being changed just for Jesse, everybody would benefit from that rule change, and everybody would have the same rights that Jesse would. So let's say you say, we'll make it 15 feet, then he can have his sign, but then everybody has to have the same right that Jesse does. Um, and that's, that's what I would probably recommend. We, is, is we, would take a, we could take a look at it, get more information on this, and bring you some information for next time. Okay. Thanks. Sounds like a good conversation to have. Uh, and you're, you're beyond your three minutes, so, but thank you for bringing thank this in. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, Tom Stearns, Montpelier resident on State Street. Um, I just wanted to speak in favor of the congregate living changes. Not only is it important um, accessibility for, for housing, but um, it's only really been the last hundred years that we've been living as single families in our own private little rectangles, and about half the planet doesn't do this. And so here we are in this country struggling with affordability and struggling with mental health and lack of community and connection in many ways. And congregate living has typically been thought of mostly as um, a special population type of housing. And I just really applaud the um, expansion of it and the recognition that there are many people who are desiring to live in a, um, a shared living arrangement and the affordability of not everybody needing to have their own kitchen, for example, is an important piece, piece and I think um, is healthy for our community. Um, my question is in regards to parking requirements for congregate living and if there's any changes because once you start sharing a kitchen, it's very contagious to start sharing other things such as vehicles there's a quite a big affordability factor that comes into that, especially if you're talking about this happening downtown where it's really walkable or, or nearby at least. So please don't make congregate living places have to have as many parking places as normal spots. Thank you. Thanks. Mike, do you know what the proposal is on that? Off the top of my head, what I can say is I know that congregate living, because you aren't counting dwelling units, you're counting um, square footage of the property instead so it's based kind of more like a commercial you'd have a parking space per so many square feet and it would kind of work the same way but again similar to um, dwelling unit we have rules that are set out and with parking I mean unlike the signs where it didn't look like we had as many waiver requests or at least I didn't see waiver requests we can also talk about adding waiver requests to, to the signs um, Parking has a whole range of options to, uh, so if you've got a project that doesn't have enough parking or doesn't have any parking at all, you could get a waiver for parking uh, based on having um, uh, bicycle parking or you're proximate to the downtown and therefore people can walk there. You can have uh, proximate to, the, to, to bus routes. So there's a lot of options to go in and get waivers from the DRB, but the zoning administrator doesn't have that opportunity to give those waivers. It has to go to a board and it has to get heard by neighbors because obviously if you, um, if your proposal is going to be putting more cars on a street, 
uh, as a neighbor, you might want to go and have some input on that. Some streets are perfectly fine. They don't have a parking issue. Other streets might have a parking issue that the DRB wants to take into consideration and make sure that you've exhausted all of your options on site. You might be able to go through and say, you know, you might not want to extend your driveway another 15 feet, but we're going to require you to extend it another 15 feet because you could add another parking space, that mm -hmm. type of thing. Um, and that, that's what the DRB has the flexibility to do. Thanks. Um, Tim, you had a question? Yeah, actually, I thought Jesse, um, his point addressed the kind of a fundamental zoning issue that I've kind of struggled with for quite a while and watching how this code has changed over my career, which is a while, but still not that long. Um, and it, it's just fascinating how I don't know if you've got it up on your screens if you've gone through this zoning code but maybe some of you haven't been through the whole thing before but it's become just really cumbersome and it's all about controlling what other people do you could not build Montpelier the way it looks today under this code you just couldn't and um, but we love it this is our town and we love the way it looks we love the way it works and I don't feel this zoning code serves us very well. I think it's one of the primary reasons we haven't seen new housing created here. It's really uh, out of control. And I think the discussion about a sign, um, there was a very intelligent discussion, but it went nowhere. And that's what happens with so many things that people want to do in Montpelier because of this. Uh, the housing committee has just started the subcommittee to start looking at it. But really, we need to be talking about it. And if we're making these big changes in our zoning code, I think things worked a lot better when I remember when it was about a sixth of the length that it is now. It's that much bigger than when I started out. Um, and it just goes on and on. An intelligent, educated person, I don't think, can come in with a project and read this and understand it without having to hire a lawyer and an engineer and go into the staff and ask for their interpretation. <laughs> because there's so many um, things buried in it that you just can't, it, it doesn't make sense. So I'd, I'd like to see a bigger review of zoning um, and actually reduce it. Thanks, Tim. Well, you're way behind the lectern, but come on up. <laughs> I've, been at, I've been trying to make sure that remember you're there and you want to be heard, so. Thank you. Uh, I've got some comments that I'll take one pass them around, please. And while that's happening, um, your point. Can you start out by introducing yourself? I'm sorry, Thomas Weiss, resident of Montpelier District 2. Montpelier's first zoning was in July of 1943, so anything older than that was done without zoning in place. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Alfano, some flood information. I'm a hydrologist and streamflow person. I'll relate your question to the flood of July. The flood of 2%, 2 tenths of a percent annual probability, which is the base that the proposal is for, was about a foot higher than the flood of July. Downtown, it, at, as he pointed out, it will vary around the city, but, but just for rough purposes. Adding two feet on that would be two feet, would be about three feet higher than the flood we had. And I don't know if all of you are aware of the flood marker to the right of the stairs just as you come through the doors. That flood elevation of the 1927 flood, which was the largest flood w that has been recorded in Montpelier, would put three inches of water on this floor. So, and now I'll start my testimony. Uh, these comments are based on my experience as a hydrolo hydrologist and a streamflow hydrologist, meaning I made some of the first flood maps in Vermont back both sides in 1980. Um, and I also analyzed the flood of July 2023. Uh, the regulations are intended to further purposes and policies of a section of statute that include resilient community development in a manner that will promote safety against floods and that will encourage flood resilient communities. As we're aware, the 2023 flood showed us that our flood resilience can be improved. Resilience in this case relates to the speed at which facilities recover from a flood and the cost of that recovery. 
And these proposed amendments I don't think go far enough because they only relate to critical facilities. Um, I believe that the flood of 1927 should be the basis of our uh, design flood elevations. Uh, that flood is going to come again. The flood that we had in July, the precipitation was about three quarters of the precipitation of the flood of 1927. And there's no reason to expect that we're not going to get a storm that big again. So I, I anyway, I'll leave it there. We just don't know when it's going to happen. And I disagree with the fundamental concept of this proposed amendment, which is that an individual's home is less worthy of protection than City Hall or the high school or any of the other items that are called out as critical facilities. Um, and if you're going to increase protection for some class of facilities, I request that you provide the same level of protection for all the facilities, which would be done by deleting uh, the sections relating to critical facilities and amending 644, which is the design flood elevation, and put that information into that section. I'm surprised that hasn't been done already in this one. Um, no matter what design flood elevation you use, I think C-121 needs to be amended to properly include everything within the area below the design flood elevation and not just the flood hazard areas or the boundary of the 0.2% annual probability. Because if the pro th what the proposal is is to regulate everything in that area up to this elevation, but if it's an area where the ground is down here, well, you don't have to regulate it to this elevation because it's outside the boundary. Um, now, I know you're beyond the, uh, the time limit, but I know that I, I'm interested in hearing you hit the high points of what your comments are about the Country Club Road property. We have two hearings, so I get two comment periods. Oh, yeah, you definitely, I assume, I assume you'll be back that two weeks from now, too. Uh, uh, probably, but um, I su suggest that the design flood be based on a freeboard that'll be above the elevations of the 1927 flood, and I ask that you strike the term 500-year flood from the uh, regulations. That was a political decision that was made years ago because it gives people a false sense of security. And I suggest that you refer to it everywhere in the uh, regulations as the flood of 0.2% annual probability. Uh, there's a, I've got some more comments that are written. I won't go over them now on this part. Uh, so I can now move to the Country Club, Club Road, if that's okay. Yes. Um, and, and we're yes. Yeah, start giving another two minutes based on zoning, or three minutes based on zoning rather than flood I've plane, got flood a 231-page zoning amendments, ten page, uh, four pages with a hundred different comments, and I'm only allowed two minutes. I don't think that's appropriate. I understand. We have. We have uh, procedure, procedural rules, at, and uh, I'd, I'd like to work with you on getting in what the important things anyway, you have to say are. The uh, Country Club Road property, um, the major point is that the property does not belong in the Urban Center 1 district. If you retain the goals for the property, then it belongs in some kind of a new district, which might be called an urban residential district. If you look at the purpose of the urban center one, uh, this property is not in the historic downtown. It's not in the capital complex. It's not in an adjacent mixed use neighborhood. It doesn't have any of the infrastructure that's required to be in place in an urban center one district. So I give you some suggestions as to the purpose of a, a new district, which I happen to be calling urban residential. You might call it something else. But uh, it just doesn't belong in the urban center one. And when I look through the table of uses of what's allowed in urban center one, many of those are inappropriate for 
what I believe is being planned for the uh, at country club property, either in the denser area or in the residential 3,000, is it, segment. So um, there is that. I think there are some points uh, that don't comply with Act 47. As I read Act 47, uh, the tables of dimensions, uh, a simplex, one unit, would be one dwelling unit per 6,000 square feet ma maximum. I believe that Act 47 allows duplexes at 6,000 square feet. Uh, two, so that would be two units per 6,000 square feet, and then triplexes or larger would be one dwelling unit per 6,000 square feet each. There are a number of other comments. And the last item is the restricting access to sunlight uh, or the, the restrictions to solar access. As Mike mentioned, that was discussed two years ago. Uh, I testified against striking that. That proposal does not comply with the master plan, and I list in my written document uh, six points within the master plan that, it, that, that striking that would if you strike it, it would not comply with the master plan in those six points. I've got uh, some text there, definition of top of bank, I suggest being amended, and there are a few more proofreading problems. And I understand how hard it is to find proofreading problems, so I'm not making a point, just pointing them out so maybe they can get corrected. Thank okay. you very much for allowing me more than my share of time to speak. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Mike, do you have any thoughts or response to any of these comments now? Um, I guess a couple of them that, that just jumped out I wanted to mention. So the flood of 27, um, making that the flood of record, um, as opposed to what is the hydro hydraulic models. Of what happened after 1927 was uh, a whole series of flood control dams were built upstream. So Wrightsville, um, the Marshfield Dam, and the uh, one up out of North Barry, Barry Dam. East Barry. Yep, the Orange mm -hmm. East Barry Dam. So those three flood control structures hold back a tremendous amount of water and make a big difference. So we had, uh, I believe, 6.8 inches of rain this summer. Uh, we had that in about 24 hours. The 1927 flood was about eight inches of water over uh, a longer period of time, over 48 hours. So they're very, very similar, but uh, at the same time, you could see the benefit of those flood control dams, and that's why we did not see. If we did not have those flood control dams, we would have seen the flood of 27 all over again. Um, it's the flood control dams that have made a tremendous amount of difference. And I'm not a hydrologist. I'm a certified floodplain manager. I do know the maps that we have that are developed are developed by engineers using H&H &H hydraulic and hydrologic models based on the rainfall, based on the topography, based on the computers. So um, they have pretty accurately, if we considered June to be a 100-year flood, 1% um, chance annual flood event, then we pretty much mapped our 100-year flood event. It was pretty close. It was a little higher in the Winooski, so people in lower State Street, State Street had slightly above um, that level, but for most of the people on the North Branch, it was about the 100-year flood event. So the maps, that was a pretty extreme weather event. It, only, it hasn't happened that bad in a long, long time, and so that was a pretty good measure. So we require people to be two feet above that. All projects that have been developed at that elevation, transit center, um, sometimes it's small things. Sometimes people are just putting in a heat pump, and we made them elevate the heat pump two feet above base flood elevation they didn't get their, their um, equipment damaged because it was elevated. So um, meeting two feet above base flood elevation has worked. That's not to say it isn't a good idea for us to have a debate about whether or not it should be three feet. Um, but I would con continue to use what we have as the, the federal model and the federal floodplain maps and simply add more freeboard 
above that because that keeps us more consistently when we talk to the state and when we talk to other folks. Using that benchmark makes, makes more sense. Um, we can certainly add more free board to that if we think that makes uh, is a benefit. Uh, I don't disagree um, getting to the Urban One comment for Country Club Road. Uh, I don't disagree. We, we, we put that together as a more of a, a quicker thing. We didn't want to go through and create a whole new zoning district and then find out everybody wants to go in a different direction. So certainly if the council says we, we like the direction it's going, but we really do need to go and create its own. Urban Center 1 doesn't work. We should create, perhaps as, as Tom suggests, a uh, urban residential and we, we could create a new district uh, as opposed to adding a new neighborhood to an existing district. Um, as we said, when we were developing it, we know we own it, so we're not really giving everybody the right to do whatever they want. We're gonna be working on a development agreement, so we set things out to be as flexible as possible, but he is correct. The purpose statement doesn't perfectly line up. Um, the F Act 46, there was a comment about duplexes. We already allow duplexes, so that's already something we've done. Uh, the State Home Act says if you've got a single family home, you can have a duplex. We already do that. That's already been the law of the land for Montpelier since 2018. So uh, that's why you don't see that as a recommendation in these regulations is because we already did that. Um, and the definition of top of bank, I thought we did that but I will have to double check to make sure. I thought that was on our list of repairs at the last meeting, but I'll have to get a copy of Thomas's comments if we've got I an extra one. one copy for you. Okay, thank you. I, because one council is not here today. Okay, I appreciate or, that. Or is, or is there today, not yeah. there. Okay, I appreciate that, because then I can have the list and, and look through them. Thank you. Okay, Jesse, uh, you've already spoken. I hope you have uh, very brief, yep. plans I, I, there was um i was recently introduced to something that's uh, the river corridor uh that's been adopted by the city which is apparently a state uh area um and there's a property that i'm that i'm purchasing that's eff affected by that essentially eliminating a lot of what you can do there as i understand um so i don't know just comment on maybe the river corridor has some downside to our residents as well thank you well, thanks um is there any other member of the public who would like to be heard uh, either in the room or online? Not seeing anyone asking to be recognized, I will close the public hearing and talk, have, open up for comments or questions from council. Tim. Um, just the urban one thing is something I'm still struggling with too for Country Club Road and also just looking at the concept of we'll change the zoning for us for our purposes because we're the city but we're not really establishing zoning for that area that's the highest and best use that we would intend for it to really be um, for if anyone else showed up to do anything on that property um, I, I, it seems like ethically somehow it, it we should just determine what's the right zoning for that property to create the use that should be there and that's the zoning we should be putting in place not some inappropriate moniker that lets us just do whatever we want that we won't let somebody else go do there and I certainly it's that's valid And, and, and what's what's the difference? Are we thinking of like uh, Urban One allows for like stores and dry cleaners and a whole bunch of commercial development that we probably aren't looking to put in the new neighborhood on Country Club Road? Yeah, I mean, and if if I were going to draft something up, and I and I certainly could and certainly would for the next meeting, I would just need to have some parameters of guidance of what you guys were thinking. You folks were thinking would be the appropriate 
um, sense of what we're thinking of. Um, should we put a density requirement? I mean, I could, I grabbed and used, cause, because the uh, actionable plan talked about allowing up to five stories, we only have one district that allows five stories. So if we don't do that, I we just have to create a district from kind of raw earth and make it and make it kind of fit in for that area. So then we have to start talking about, okay, if we talk about setbacks, what type of setbacks did we want thinking about? What type of bulk and massing? What type of building sizes? And that's where somebody, a developer may come in who wanted, you know, a longer single building, which would have a large footprint. And it's like, well, now we just knock that out because we have a footprint requirement of, you know, 30,000 square feet, and they were going to do one big one. Now they've got to break it into smaller pieces. Mm -hmm. So the, the flexibility, the sense of why I did it was just to, let's see where people are going and then we can kind of put them together but we can certainly come in and go through and say you know what we do kind of have a sense of where we want to go with this we're going to want multiple buildings uh they're going to be of a certain size and we can put it in there and we can always change it later that's always an option to go through and change it later to go through and say well we were thinking this is where it was going to go it didn't go this way let's do a quick we can do an emergency amendment and change it in a couple of weeks um, Tim, do you have a follow-up on this? Yeah, well, I guess my other follow-up was just looking at the proposed zoning map, and so we also have it abutting rural zone areas, like some of the Zorzi Golden property is still the green for rural, and some of the Town Hill properties. I'm trying to understand why it's property owner specific, and if you've mentioned Savings Pasture or Agent Zorzi that or Golden, that it would be part of the TIF and part of the district we're trying to create, would, shouldn't they have similar zoning? Goldman is, they are already rezoned on their side. Uh, we did that, the lower 15 acres of theirs is zoned for uh, Riverfront, which is the same zoning district as um, Berry Street. So it allows up to um, 27 units an acre, so mm -hmm. it's very, it's very flexible. They can put a lot of uses in there, um, but it doesn't have unlimited uses. And you know, certainly we can take that same approach and use a riverfront type designation down there. Um, where the lines are on our map to the to the west, there's some green. That's actually we own that. Um, it's also steep slopes. Um, some of that is a parcel going a little bit south of that is owned by Steve Ribellini. Again, very rugged, not easily developable, mostly forested, mostly wet. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of the ones around it, the two areas we've carved out are the two areas that are open. And most of the areas that aren't open are really rugged and not very developable. So that's why we've kept those in rural. We don't expect those, even if we wanted to, I don't think those would be easily developable pieces of land. So that little blue area is all that you think is developable of the? Uh, I think the urban center area that's carved out there is about 20 acres. And then the piece across the top is another 15, something to something, something in that ballpark. Mm -hmm. um, so it looks small on map, um, but you know, it's, it's 20 acres in size. It's a decent piece of, piece of property. Thanks. Thanks. Um, Mike, is, I, have, I have an over, a question that relates to Tim's overall big picture question, which is the zoning ordinance is too big, too complicated, and uh, we, we need um, a massive overhaul, not something like this, uh, to paraphrase. Now, if I'm right, it, from working on previous zoning uh, amendment, efforts it seems like a lot of the reason that it's so long and detailed is to allow for administrative approval of things that uh, that we want to encourage is that right uh so yes that's um there are a couple of things some is as courts uh jm golf is a big decision uh, as decisions have gone along through su supreme courts and environmental decisions they require more detail and regulations there's an expectation developers have to have an expectation of knowing whether or not they would meet a permit when they come in to apply uh, so 
we have to then, we can't just have rules that say, you know, you have to be compatible with your neighborhood. Um, you actually have to describe what that means and what that looks like, or you can't have a negative impact on the scenic qualities of an area. You have to actually express what that means. And if we're going to have administrative permits, which we have drastically changed, um, you know, uh, when I got here, we, we're basically issuing the same number of permits we did in 2014 when I got here as we are now. Um, when I got here in 2014, permits, if you count every day a permit sits in our office, there was 9,000 permit days. We're now down to 900 permit days. Um, an average permit only stays in my office for about two days. We do a couple hundred permits a year. So permits go through really quickly. Uh, we used to have 50% of all applications went to the DRB. We now are down to um, like 10%. So most applications don't go to the DRB. And so a lot of that requires us to then go through and have have rules. And the more you get into it, the more questions that come up. And so you need to have more answers for more questions of, well, what, what happens in this scenario and what happens in that scenario? Uh, we do have staff that understand the rules and you're more than welcome, you know, or if your, your taxes support them. They, it doesn't cost you anything to call and talk to the zoning administrator or the assistant zoning administrator and ask them questions and have them guide you through the process. That is free of charge. You're not charged until you put your application in. So please take advantage of that. If you've got questions, you don't have to read the regulations. Uh, they will, they'll move all the things that you don't need to worry about off the table. Um, and the other changes that have happened were some other uh, concerns in, that people had that we, we really wanted to add in. Um, people were concerned about steep slopes. People were concerned we, you know, 10 years ago, uh, before 2018, we had no regulation of wetlands. We had no regulations of steep slopes. We had no regulations of riparian buffers on our streams. Um, to add those in, adds pages, but most projects aren't going to need to meet those requirements. So they are there and they do take up space, but only projects that have Just because the city did, doesn't mean they weren't regulated. For wetlands, correct. Yeah. But the state does not rec regulate steep slopes, and they don't rec uh, regulate the riparian buffers. So that was some, some concerns the public had for policies, or the council had for policies that were included. Um, and, but in following up on the other thing, is it uh, feasible to say that once we're finished with approving the city plan which i know is 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 coming towards us uh on the highway that that might be a, an opportune moment to start looking at like it does the zoning ordinance in general look like what we want it to look like or should there be changes uh you're always welcome to look at that that is going to be another opportunity um uh you know i i guess the other point I would make um, was uh, our zoning actually was very was was specifically studied in 2016 up to 2018 to make sure that every one of our neighborhoods could be built under this zoning and that was the whole argument that was in in 2017 was people didn't like the fact that we were increasing our densities of all of our neighborhoods you're doubling and tripling the density of our neighborhood and we were just like that's what's already there we are simply changing our zoning to match what our neighborhoods are because if something happened to your neighborhood, you could rebuild it under our current zoning. It was something like 90% yes. threshold. Yeah, we have a 90% threshold. 90% mm -hmm. of our properties within every neighborhood should be conforming. We could certainly go for a higher number. That was what we left because we knew every neighborhood has a building or two that might be really small or really big. And so we made a 90% rule to try to get everybody conforming because we, we wanted to make that actually a reality. We didn't want to have zoning rules that, you know, and before we had more than 50% of our properties before 2018, 50%, more than 50% were non-conforming, either a non-conforming parcel or non-conforming structure. And by the zoning, that meant you had to go to the DRB to get approval, which is why everybody had to go to the DRB. Whether you wanted to put a porch on or a deck on, you were always having to go to the DRB. And we eliminated almost all of those. So we really approve a lot of permits very quickly. Um, and then we added more pages to the document when we did the design review rules because our design review rules were, were five statements. 
each with like six words and that just doesn't <laughs> will not pass the jam golf test uh at all so we had to add more language to explain what what these meant and that way we could be more precise and be able to more efficiently especially over time a lot of the complaints of the old design review was well i'd get this approved in 2006 and designed and, and disapproved in 2012 and then approved again in 2018 they should always be administered the same way which means you need to have a little bit more guidance to ensure that even as board members change you can get a consistent ruling on the same set of rules and mm -hmm. so that was a big change um, again it adds more text it does um, but it's it actually is to the benefit of the applicant to have that text thanks Lauren you had your hand up uh, what seems like kind of a long time ago but <laughs> uh, yeah, just a couple kind of comments and one question. Um, one, just overall, really appreciate seeing the um, move to more density. That's just, I think, great for what we need for um, additional housing for the community. Um, the solar shading issue, I remember the conversation a couple of years ago, and it did feel like the current language is way too strict. At the time, we it was like we didn't have time to come up with some middle ground. Like throwing it out altogether also seems like a blunt response. Like we're in the process of the state house of passing a much more ambitious renewable energy standard that's going to require a lot more solar development. So I'm just curious about like has the energy advisory committee looked at this? Maybe we could get some feedback on like a much narrower but still having some provision so that we're not. Um, totally removing possible solar access as a consideration. Um, so I would like to ask them. I think they're meeting before the next meeting, I believe, um, the next hearing. So I'll see if I can get some feedback from them. Um, I don't know if you already have, but. Uh, no, well, you have not. OK. And then just just for the, the flood level issue, I mean, just with all the climate change modeling and stuff, I just think if we're especially if we're making new investments and in, in things we should like the higher the better <laughs> like like you know within reason but like certainly i think this is a good step in the right direction but um i mean it's pretty uh scary when you look at the climate science and so i think we should be anticipating that things will be ratcheting up and getting worse and that you know we should expect that 1927 flood we should be preparing for it and we should be you know doing everything to prevent um you know, putting people at risk unnecessarily if we're making new regulations. So just erring in that direction would be um, my preference in general. Um, and I guess my just last question about the, when we were talking about changing the zoning around the country club, is there any difference depending on how we do it in terms of um, growth center designation or anything that intersects with the state or is that all not related and any, does, any zoning change we would make wouldn't impact that or? Is, does that something we have to think about? Uh, the growth center requirement is it has to be at least four units an acre. So even if we were talking about, you know, going to a riverfront standard, that would be 27 units an acre. So we're, we're not going to be anywhere close to, I mean, we're going to be way, way under the density requirements needed for growth center, whatever we choose. Any other council? Donna. If I put solar panels on my roof, I don't want someone to come and then build something next to it that takes away my sun. <laughs> so it thinks we need something there. Um, I don't have the answer. I just have the worry. And I was really glad when we did the 90%. That was, to me, real progress, that we made sure that what was in a neighborhood designation matched up with 90%. It, it really was practical. <laughs> um, and I don't like parking being removed. We already removed a lot of parking. And I see person after person <laughs> who has either rented or working somewhere who don't have parking, and particularly with the winter time. And so I feel we, we may have to really look at that because it's fine for the developer, but when you don't have a lot of choices for housing, you take what you can get and then you struggle with the car. And I didn't feel so bad taking parking away when we were thinking of a parking garage <laughs> and people had some options. But uh, I, I don't think uh, that I'm totally comfortable with all the removal of parking. 
And when it comes to the country club road, I really see maximum flexibility for now. And as things move, we can narrow that down. But I remember a discussion with Savings Pasture. At one point, three years ago, four years ago, we were sitting around the table and we modified that area because that owner came with us with a proposal. And to me, is that's being flexible to the time. It was getting us where our vision was as a city, and yet the zoning at the time didn't match it because we wanted some of that with, the, with this partner who was coming to us to have housing, but some part to stay open for public access. And so I see the same thing with the Country Cup. There's a lot of different uses, and the more flexibility we have as we sit around and develop those uses, then the better off we are. Um, and so I, I don't see we should be treated any different than anybody else who comes and says, gee, we have this idea. It really matches the gold of housing and recreation. Let's, let's try to make this zoning work. So that's where I'm coming from, if, if that makes any sense, Tim, to you. Thank you. Carrie, did you have your hand up? OK. Um, I feel like we've identified about a half dozen things, maybe not quite that many, that, that are questions that uh, people might want a, a deeper look at, you know, including what should we call Country Club Road, what, uh, uh, and this is, you know, talking about taking some of Dr. Weiss's comments into uh, consideration, uh, a couple of flood things, the um, solar, am I missing anything? Signs, yep. And, you know, I don't know if we'll be, be able to get through all of that with, uh, with one more public hearing, one more meeting, um, assuming that uh, Tim's idea of re-looking at the entire ordinance, I, I would hate to see that hold up the changes that we have before us uh, right now. Um, but, uh, Pellin, I can't tell. Are you raising your hand or just, uh, okay, okay, thanks. Um, could, uh, could we have a motion from someone uh, Ask, uh, scheduling a second public hearing with the idea in mind that the uh, Zone, zoning doesn't need a, the unlike an ordinance zoning doesn't need the because it's uh, following a different statute it's already warned for the 28th okay so we don't have to we don't have to vote on anything tonight we just no unless you had a particular change um, as I said if people are okay I'm going to make those three changes to the document so that way the document is refreshed with those three changes mm -hmm. um, that I described, if those are fine. And I will come back with um, a new zoning district that's going to require me to add another column onto my <laughs> use table. That's what I was trying to avoid having to do. <laughs> um, my sense, if you guys are okay with this, because the Actionable plan talked about six stories. I went with that because it was six stories. We've also talked about Riverfront, which has a lot of density. I could make a district that's very similar to Riverfront, which is Berry Street. And Berry Street includes Stonecutter's Way, so it's got a lot of uses that are allowed in those areas. Um, but it would allow for six stories, which was it's either five or six stories. I think it's five stories that might be in the plan. I'll, I'll double check whether it's five or six, but we can make that match. So that would be um, up to 27 units an acre, and if that's about 10 acres, I would allow up to 270 mm -hmm. units in the lower area. That, that seems like a possibly a way to go. I'm not sure. I remember, um, might have even been before I was on the council, one of the previous iterations of this zoning and savings pasture debate where people were saying that we should be designing the new neighborhood in Sabin's Pasture or wherever we're going to build it to be able to have like a, a little neighborhood store so someone wouldn't, living there wouldn't have to drive downtown to get, uh, get a gallon of milk or wouldn't ha necessarily have to drive down to, down to do that, those kinds of errands. Um, whether there's enough business to 
make that feasible, especially in light of the fact that there's a little store kind of like that right on uh, Route 2. I don't know, but that's, that's the flexibility that we, we may lose if we change it into just urban residential. So I'll just throw that, throw that into the mix. So, uh, so I'll make a new district. We can vote on whether you want to keep it or change it. Mm -hmm. I will get information on the sign that Jesse was talking about, just so we've gotten information so we can make a decision whether we want to make additional changes to the sign rules. And I'll make those three changes that I proposed at the start so we've got a complete document to, to propose. And, and then maybe we'll think about solar. And yep we have no no decisions yet on solar we can certainly talk about the different mm -hmm. uh, details of that it's it's the way it's currently written is very problematic so if we keep it we should certainly talk about making changes to it okay donna i just had a question about uh, michael's coming back with a new zone and that time we can still decide if we want it to be flexible or are we losing flexible <laughs> totally depends on what we put in it right oh, I know but you're asking him to come back with something so I'm, it's not a done deal it's that compared yeah. to the flexibility that he came with tonight I'm not sure what the answer is to that my, I, my I think my sense is I'm, oh, I'm I can leave what's in the proposal right now which is the very flexible and come in with the proposal and then you guys can decide okay. yeah somebody will make a motion that says let's take out the urban center one designation and replace it with the new proposal that Mike brought in or okay. keep it yeah and okay. you can vote it either way thank you sounds good everybody happy with this for next time the good news for next time I just checked is that um, other than getting the audit report well this is really all you have on the agenda so this is the building code stuff so um, so you'll have all evening great and well other stuff we have we've come to learn that what we think is on the agenda two weeks from now tends well, to that, especially <laughs> if we put anything off tonight yep exactly okay thank you um back to you're still up mike i'm still up sorry kurt um building code first public hearing i owe him and i, I owe will, him big now and i will open the public hearing on the uh amendments to the building code this one hopefully will be much much faster um, and I've regretted saying that before in the past too. <laughs> um, so tonight we've got the first reading on amendments to the building regulations um, so what this hearing is about this is the first of two readings uh, this is going to work just like your standard ordinances if you haven't done an, an ordinance amendment if you're new uh, there, there are two, two readings. You have a first reading and a second reading. Uh, the changes are being proposed to remove the fee exemption for energy efficiency projects and changes to clean up the building regulations for accuracy and to make them more defensible if challenged in court. Um, you were given both the clean version and the red line version in your packet because the red line version was all over the place, so it might be easier just to read a clean version. And council could take the opportunity to talk about the flood exemption for the flood fee exemption that still exists. Uh, there is no end date on it, but it's not part of the regulations. But I just wanted to put that out there. If people wanted to talk about that, we could put that on as well. So why remove the fee exemption? Um, staff is, remo is recommending removing the exemption for energy efficiency projects because there are many types of projects the city supports like affordable housing projects they all pay fees only energy efficiency and accessibility projects and I'll talk about that in a little bit get a fee exemption these projects still have administrative costs still have inspections we don't believe the fee is a barrier to anyone doing any of these projects and probably most significantly is the exemption makes a significant difference in the amount of money we collect in 2023, energy efficiency projects made up 25% of all non-flood related building permits. So we had 162 permits that were not associated with the flood. 40 of them paid no fees because they were energy efficiency projects. 
that could be insulating, that could be putting in heat pumps, that could be putting solar panels. Anything that qualifies as um, energy efficiency doesn't pay fees. Um, because we don't ask for project costs, we don't know how much this is going to generate or how much of a difference this is going to make, but we know it's going to probably generate more than $10,000 in additional income. So generally, fee exemptions would have been built into a fee schedule. So why are we amending the regulations? Why are we coming to amend the regulations? They're usually built into fee schedules, but in this case, it is literally written into the ordinance. Uh, the other exemption in the ordinance is handicapped accessibility improvements. Um, these could be as small as handicap ramps to as big as elevators. We aren't recommending removing the fees on accessibility apps. We don't generally get them, and we had none of them last year. Um, if council would like to consider removing that exemption, you're certainly welcome to as well. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> the flood permit exemption is not in the ordinance, as I mentioned earlier, and was made as an emergency measure. That can be ended or sunset at any time. Um, and staff, uh, so why did we review the rest of the regulations? Well, we were basically, we've had this list of amendments that needed to happen for a long time. Um, and this just never rose to, uh, high enough on the list to work on it, but because we were coming in for this, we figured we would come in with the, um, with the, the rest of our changes. So building regulations don't mention our cooperative agreement. All of our building inspections that we do right now, we do with a cooperative agreement with the Division of Fire Safety. There's no reference to that or any of the rules embedded in that in our ordinance, so they really aren't talking to each other and they really should. Uh, we have outdated code requirements we actually write into ordinance, we enforce the 2003 building codes, which have since been updated many times. But we are required to enforce our ordinance, and our ordinance is referring to old, ordinance, uh, old codes. So we need to update those codes, and what would be the best practice would be to go in and say, as most recently amended. So you'd have the 2018 IRC, or as most recently amended. So that way, as the IRC gets updated in 2023, or 2026, it automatically updates. We don't have to come back to you to change our regulations. That's the way it should have been written in the first place. Uh, it also had poor construction, poor organization. It's just a pet peeve of mine. I write organization, I write regulations, and they're right ways and wrong ways, and this was kind of a jumbled mess, so I tried to clean it up. Um, and then we were missing requirements necessary to allow enforcement. We don't do enforcement, not very often at all, but it does worry me when we don't properly have things set up because if we had a situation where we did want to go and issue tickets, we would not be able to. It says in here we're allowed to issue fines, but if you don't follow state law, you actually can't issue those tickets. So this is simply going to go through and make those ticketing authority um, meet state requirements, and therefore if we ever had to, which we hope we never do, we would be able to issue a ticket. So really quick. Um, the changes, we added an authority to this. It's always good to have it. It's good practice. We moved the purpose statement that was in two to replace the one that was in one because there were purpose statements in two different places. We cleaned up permit requirements. Um, and then we defined application requirements as sufficient information to determine compliance. I'm a person who puts that into most of my regulations. I don't want to list all the things you've got to put in your application because you might have a whole bunch of things that you don't need to give to me because it's not really relevant to demonstrating compliance, but then you end up with weird waiver rules to the application form. So this just cleans it up. Fees, we've discussed earlier. Um, there is an option. We just wanted to put it out there. We currently allow full refunds for projects that are not developed. There is always a lot of work associated with reviewing applications and issuing permits. You always could consider this being a partial refund you know, or in full except for $100 if a project is not developed. That's just an option we wanted to put out there. Does that come up very much? Uh, it happens more, it doesn't happen a lot, but it, it happens 10 times a year or so. I mean, but these are a lot of times we spend a lot of time working with somebody. We'll meet with them eight or 10 times to come up with a building project. We get everything permitted, ready, approved, and then they'll come back a year later and say, yeah, we're not actually going to do the project. And everybody sighs, and it's like, ah, oh, that was a lot of work to get that, all the permit reviews. But that's part of the job, and it's not an issue, but it's just with something we wanted to consider. Some places say, you get your building permit, you bought your building permit. 
and if you don't build it, you bought your building permit. Um, we haven't. We've always given full refunds. So the codes we've sh had used to be, if you look at the old code, it was a long list. We've shortened it right up, shortened it to the Vermont Building and Fire Code, the State Energy Code, and then the NFP 101, IRC and RBs are one and two family. And then, as I said, as most recently amended, and then we have a couple of unique codes, just in case you don't know, automatic sprinkler requirement and an abandoned vacant bu uh, building code. Um, we've removed a couple others that we either don't enforce, like the property maintenance code, or are covered by other codes like swimming pools. For some reason, we had special rules on swimming pools, but swimming pools are actually regulated, so we don't need them. And then we moved penalties to ticketing requirements. And the last thing, we removed licensing section as it's covered by other state statutes. So that's it. Um, and I'll take any questions. All right. Since this is a public hearing, once again, I'll start by seeing if there's anyone in the room who would like to be heard on, uh, on this or if there's anyone on Zoom who would like to be heard on this uh, topic. While we're waiting for that, I recall that there was something called the BOCA code. Is that? That was the yeah. property maintenance code that okay. nobody, as, as far as Chris Lumbra and, and Michelle knows, nobody has enforced that in their time. Okay. Yeah, the last time I remember hearing about it was in the 80s sometime. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I am not seeing any members of the public wishing to be heard, so I will close the public hearing and open it to the uh, council for comments or, or questions or thoughts. Lauren. Yeah, just on the energy efficiency fees, um, I mean, I assume this is just driven by where we need more money for the city budget, so it's a way to bring money in. I mean, I, this is one I also want to ask MIAC about potential implications um, to get the energy committee input. I mean, to me, it's like we're doing, like the state's putting incentives, the federal government and the Inflation Reduction Act is giving incentives. Like we're desperate to get people to do energy efficiency projects with like the climate crisis. So to be like, let's make it more expensive as we also are pouring like state and federal incentives just seems counter to a big urgent need that we have as a society to reduce fossil fuel use and climate pollution. So going after this of all things just seems like against other goals and like literally the state will give an incentive to someone and then they'll have to put that money towards a Montpelier fee to do it. It just seems like not the right place to go after additional money, but that's just my opinion. Donna. Approximately how much those fees average a project? I mean, in the big picture, we issue 100 and this year we issued 242 building permits, but 80 of them were flood related. So usually we're in about 160 building permits. That raises about 75 to $100,000 a year. It depends on how big the projects are, if you have any big projects. Um, so having 25% of the permits um, not paying. And as we said, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Downstreet comes in, has a project, they've got to pay their fee. It's affordable housing. There's, there's a lot of public good out there, a lot of projects we support. But um, we also have staff that have to go and administer and enforce and do the work of those projects. And I think if this were a handful of projects every year, we wouldn't be worrying about it, but we just went through a very long process of trying to come up with where, where we could be getting additional revenues and to have 25%, to find that 25% of our projects um, didn't pay. And just, I'll also put out there, in total, 50% of our projects didn't pay fees because the flood had, the flood exemption mm -hmm. was another 80 permits that we didn't get fees on. That we understand, that's a one year, one time thing. Um, but we did have exactly 50% of the permits. It was like uh, 260 and 130 permits didn't pay any fees this year. So it's, and we only raised, we're supposed to raise $75,000. We're at 
$25,000 in building permits right now. Hmm. So we are significantly under where, underperforming in our permit fees. So um, I, th I, I just, I think it's, if the council decides you wanna keep it, that's perfectly fine. That is, that's your policy decision. I'm putting it in front of you because I think it's my job as the director to go through and bring it to your attention that I think this exemption is having a, a difference, a uh, significant difference in the amount of fees that we're, we're collecting. Uh, but for next meeting, could you come back, or the next hearing, come back and, and share the average the solar projects would pay? We don't know that because oh. they're, as soon as they're exempt, we don't ask them how much the project is. Building fees, for everyone oh, to I understand, see. building see. fees are paid based on the amount of investment. So it's I, I uh, $8 plus a certain amount per $1,000 of the project. Um, and as soon as they're exempt, we're like, yeah, it doesn't matter. We don't care. I'm sorry. You said that earlier. As yeah. soon as you repeated it, I remembered. I'm sorry. Okay. Oh, Thank you. Yeah, Tim. I got a few unrelated ones. Um, okay. So one that I was actually thinking about with the zoning, but it's also with this is the time limits issue for permits. And it's come up a little bit this time, too, uh, or at least looking through this red line version. So if you issue permits, um, is this also like a maximum one extension? Oh, for how, how long they're valid for? Yeah. Um, yeah, I didn't look at that provision, but that is, I don't know in, in what it is in this one. It could be extended as well. Seems I think it's one year, it's good, they're good for one year. That would be my memory, but it feels like, it save a lot of just backtracking, it might make sense to make these longer, to be more practical. I mean, I, Having thinking about this last year for me, for example, I was going to replace the atrium on the Blanchard block, got the permits, staffed it all the work, and then um, the flood hit, and I didn't have the extra oh. money to do a project like that. So I'm, I'll definitely miss the dates. Uh, yeah, it's totally a selfish way of looking at it, no, but it's but an it's example of yeah. something that uh, yeah, we certainly I'm sure could. other people are going through. Yeah, we certainly could either as a one-time thing or just as a general rule of thumb. Usually, people come in to get building permits at the time because. You're going to have a you're going to have a right. financial outlay. So usually people are coming in. I'm going to start building in the next two weeks, and here's my my permit and my fee. So usually development starts right away. But this is a unique case. But we certainly could. There's nothing in statute that says it can't be longer. Yeah, I mean it's also just getting contractors now for everybody is an issue. So maybe longer would be something to think about. Um, is is there a downside to letting people keep their uh, permit open longer? Not that I can really think of. Okay, yeah. um, you know, it's not like these are rules that change significantly such that it's like, oh, we're going to issue something, and then six months later, oh, that would have been illegal had they applied now. I mean, there's very few incidents where something like that's going to happen. So I think issuing a permit and having it open longer, I don't think it's going to, I don't think it's actually going to come up often, but, you know, as this case points out, that's that's a real, that's a real thing. Um. The other two are just the, the flood permit exemptions. So if that comes up in a year, uh, same topic really. Um, just working through virtually impossible to get commercial electricians. I don't know when we'll be able to do projects, but we're going to be way beyond a year. Um, same with our elevators. I mean, there's and those are really big ticket items. So um, obviously, if you get permit fees on that, you get a lot more money. <laughs> so, uh, uh, yeah, some communities have have stopped their permit fees uh, with the waiver. So they're getting people to pay again. Uh, if, if you were asking me, I would not be stopping the exemption before the end of this year, um, just be calendar year, because we've talked mm -hmm. about um, when the flood happened, people said, how long do I have to elevate my utilities in the basement? And we said, it's going to take a while for all these plumbers and electricians to get through. You got till the end of 2024. So it doesn't make sense for us to then go and pull the pull the permit fee out from under them um put the fee exemption um so i would say if you were going to we would at least be keeping the fee exemptions through but again it's a policy and a decision of the council if you guys want to keep it indefinitely yeah, it can stay indefinite too but eventually as time goes on flood damage is just gonna go away right so there, there'll be yeah and then the third one i had was just the sprinkler system clarification because that ordinance like, so we did away with, or somebody did away with it way before my time, but on for single family homes, right? It's only for multi 
Yeah, I believe it, it was initially, and I might need to do a little bit, I think it was initially to everything, single family, everything. two family. Yeah. We then exempted single family, and I'm trying to think if we also got the exemption onto two minutes, family. He did for twos, if yeah. they have an outside entry or something yeah, like that. There's, yeah, there's a, a yeah, is it now up to four? I think it is. I think okay, because I know we had a conversation. Up, starts at four. I it was a, you check with Bob. yeah, uh, okay. Barb Conray had a big push on trying to, Push that up a little bit. Yeah. We were in. I just don't remember exactly whether it went to four, or went to three, but it. Okay. Thanks. But yeah, that's a sprinkler requirement that does not apply across the state. It's something we had adopted before my time. Because the thought being, if we had more, more buildings with sprinklers, we would have less need for a fire department, and over time, we might be able to work our way towards a volunteer fire department. I think that was the theory. <laughs> Plus, and then it didn't work out because they were. I think it was the idea that as as we grew, if we had sprinklers in every home, as we grew, we would need to expand the fire department. You know, oh, wouldn't need to expand we, we the fire have, department. The, the, okay. the size would be the same as opposed to you know we might need more police, more public works, like but if we get more housing, we wouldn't uh, have that need. And also, it's it, they are clearly proven to be safer for life safety, but they're a cost to housing, and so yeah. at some point. We said, okay, well, we'll change the continuum. So, yeah. But, yeah, it wasn't that we were going to go to volunteer. No, I, and, I, and, I knew and there was would, some story behind it, but, yeah. And people would save money on their homeowner's insurance by, if they have a sprinkler. Yeah, and, and, and there's a yeah. tax credit. The tax mm -hmm. credit, it was all put as a package. You get the tax credit, you put in the sprinkler. Tax credit based for your maintenance. You're about even. Yeah. <laughs> but I think it probably, it would, it would take a long time to have the insurance savings catch up with what you spent bent to put the <laughs> sprinklers in. Anybody else? Okay, are we ready to have a motion to set this? We are ready to set a motion to set a public, another public hearing. Is someone ready to do that? And keeping in mind that there are some things that uh, we're gonna look at changing before the next time. So is this motion just about the building code hearing that we're having? Yeah. So I'll make a motion that we proceed with the second hearing for the building code on February 28th. Mm -hmm. Is there a second? Second. Any uh, further discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay, great, thank you. We have now we have next buyouts. Is that you, Mike? No, I, that is not me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll need to just be able to get that, that guy back out. So we can close that guy. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's oh did I lose Josh? No, oh, there he is. Oh, Josh, there he is. Okay, beautiful. Just give me one second to get my fob back. Do you have a presentation or no? Okay. It's going to be really Get the leak <laughs> Hope you all enjoyed your evening in Montpelier. <laughs> That's right. Yes, Pete, members of the council have given up their Valentine's night. <laughs> all right. I'll pass this around again. Get my keys back. Ready, Josh? Yep. Okay. Uh, Josh Jerome, Community and Economic Development Specialist with the City of Montpelier. Um, I'll keep it pretty brief because I know there's some other individuals behind me that would love to be up here. Um, but this is sort of just a preview um, as we've gone further into the uh, recovery process. Um, we know that there's going to be a number of buyouts um, that the council is going to have to um, consider. Um, and we're at that point now. Um, in my action item, I mentioned two. There's going to be a third one um, that we intend to bring to you in a couple weeks. So just wanted to preview that. Um, these individuals are all substantially damaged properties. Um, even some of them might be repetitive loss structures or severe re repetitive loss structures. Um, the city has um, entered into a memorandum of agreement with Vermont Emergency Management 
uh, for them to handle the administration of all of our acquisition projects. That will relieve us the burden of managing the grants through FEMA, um, the state themselves, they'll handle all of that. Um, what we would do as a city is just sort of be liaison between the property owner and VEM um, and to help um, make that a, a smooth closing. Um, because ultimately, you know, during an acquisition, the city is um, taking ownership of the parcel uh, and agreeing to maintain that parcel after it's converted into green space um, to be maintained as green space in perpetuity. Um, so there's a number of, of uh, funding sources that VEM has access to. Um, and my understanding is that as acquisition projects come into the queue, they will put them in the right bucket um, at that time. For instance, like um, some could go into the Flood Resilient Communities Fund, that, that's a state-run fund, or uh, a, FEMA, a FEMA program called Swift Current, um, or their regular hazard mitigation grant program, um, which is available to us. So um, all three of them have different cost share structures, ranging from 75-25 all the way to 100% um, covered. Obviously, that, that's what our goal is, um, is to get these individuals into uh, a, a program that has 100% cost share so the community doesn't have to come up with that, um, that cost share. Um, so I just wanted to preview that. Um, we intend to bring three of them to you in a couple weeks. Um, and you'll have to vote to accept those, those parcels. Thanks, Josh. Uh, one of the things I was thinking about, as you mentioned, a uh, property being reverted to green space. Is there any, is there a definition or any regulation on what green space can be? Can it be constructed catchment or flood mitigation beyond just being unbuilt on? Um, I mean, it, it could be restored to floodplain. Um, I don't think any of these parcels um, are, are large enough to have any sort of significant impact on it. Um, but certainly um, they could all be parks, pocket parks, mm -hmm. um, which would be a nice amenity for the community. Um, and so, yeah, they're okay. just not very big parcels. Thanks. Donna. Now, are there any of the significant damaged properties that have not decided to buy out yet? And yes. if so, how long do they have? Um, timeline on that? Well, I mean, um, the funding window is, is, is finite. Um, and so if somebody wants to um, go into a buyout, um, they really should be in letting us know um, probably in the next, no later than in like the next six weeks probably, just so that we can ensure that they get into the queue um, early enough. And you're in touch individually with the, all of these property owners. And I assume you're communicating to them that you need to, you have a fixed time to make a decision and here, here's what it is. Yep. Okay. Donna. And what, what percentage of their property value do they get as a full buyout? So the process um, uses a forensic review. So they'll look at the fair market value of the property the day before um, the, the the flood event, so they'll 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 figure out what that fair market value is um, on for July 9th, 2023, and because these are all substantially damaged properties, um, and they're in the floodplain, um, they're all considered to be cost beneficial uh, according to FEMA, um, and so. You know, sometimes you have an issue where if, if they're out of the floodplain um, and it goes over a certain, um, if the, the assessed value is over a certain amount, 360000 then you have to do a full benefit cost analysis. These are not the case. Um, and so, you know, I think these properties range in assessed value from 255 um, to probably 295000 300000 So... 
part of the process is going to be allocating funds for the acquisition, uh, demolition uh, of the property, capping all the utilities, and, and restoring the site. So that's part of the whole project cost. And do they have the ability to, you know, it might be kind of a good thing for them that uh, we just went through the townwide reassessment, but, but do, uh, does the homeowner have the opportunity if they want to, to go out and get an independent appraisal to argue for a higher value than the uh, assessed value? I don't, I don't know if they have the ability to sort of um, use a third party. I mean, I think Vermont Emergency Management is going to come up with um, a method that they have to apply to every single parcel. Um, and so, you know, I, I don't, I'm not, I've not seen that in the policy um, guidelines that's if somebody doesn't like their uh, praise value that they came up with that they can challenge it. Okay. Anyone else have any other questions? And Pelham, I'm just looking on the screen to see if you're, okay. Um, I think we're set. Thanks okay. a lot, Josh. Yep. All right, item 16, leach aid. Come on down. Who's, Kurt, this is your show. Or starting out anyway, right? Yep, I am Kurt Modica, Public Works Director. Um, here tonight we've got representatives from Vermont DEC. They're gonna open up the discussion with sort of a, an overview of uh, the status of um, the regulations of, of PFAS within Vermont. And then uh, Casella is going to go through a pre presentation of um, where they're at with the treatment process of the leachate uh, up in Coventry. And then um, following their presentation, I'll provide uh, a recommendation to council. So with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Vermont DEC. Thanks for hanging in and staying with us. <laughs> Thank you for having us. You got to listen to all sorts of fascinating conversation. <laughs> <laughs> well, good evening. I'm Pete Laflamme. I'm director of the Watershed Management Division at Vermont DEC. And with me here tonight, um, Amy Palachik, uh, who's the manager of our wastewater discharge permitting program from within the division and Heather Collins, who's the supervisor of our pretreatment program, um, also within Amy's program. And I'll just talk a little bit about why this all matters and the sort of the, do a level set of where we are with the permitting and, and the, the relationship of the different permits. So as I mentioned, Amy's program issues discharge permits, direct discharge permits to wastewater treatment facilities like Montpelier, for example, um, we issue that permit. It's a federal permit. We are a delegated state, so we issue that federal permit in place of EPA. As part of that permitting process, certain discharges to the wastewater treatment facility also receive pretreatment permits. So those pretreatment permits are intended to provide treatment for substances that may not be treated at the wastewater treatment facility and also to provide treatment for subst substances that may interfere um, or pass through the wastewater treatment facility or upset the wastewater treatment facility. So that's sort of the relationship um, of the way that we permit discharges to surface waters, direct discharges from facilities themselves and certain discharges into those facilities. Um, the jurisdiction for pretreatment permits um, is triggered by the existence of a direct discharge permit. So in other words, if there's not a discharge to a Vermont wastewater treatment facility, there is no pretreatment permit that we can issue because it's then outside of our jurisdiction. Currently, why this matters, currently there is one facility in the state of Vermont that is accepting leachate from the Coventry landfill, and that's the city of Montpelier. Should the city of Montpelier decide not to accept leachate from Coventry, 
then the pretreatment permit goes away and we don't have jurisdiction over the landfill. Why does that matter? Well, our pretreatment permit, which we can talk more about, requires Casella to treat for, to remove the five Vermont regulated PFOSs. And we've been working with Casella. There's a draft discharge permit or pretreatment permit out on draft right now to have Casella operate their facility and monitor it closely over the next six months, six months from the date of issuance of the pretreatment permit, to analyze and provide the data necessary to create a um, um, effluent standard for treatment of leachate. Treatment of leachate is different than treatment of other uh, water matrices. It's a difficult matrix, and so understanding how the particular treatment system that Casella has installed is operating is really important for us to develop the so-called T-Bell or technically based effluent limitation for these types of uh, treatment facilities. So again, the pretreatment permit is, it would require that. It's been out on draft. We've received many public comments on it and we're poised to move forward with issuing that permit if we still have jurisdiction to issue a pretreatment permit. Um, I'll pause there if there are questions about any of that and I have the two experts here with me tonight to be able to answer any questions you might have. Which is so far. Okay, great. Um, the, the leachate from Casella represents one of the more significant sources of PFAS in the state. The, all of the material that all of us dispose winds up in the landfill. That material perks down through the landfill, is collected in a liner at the landfill and comes out, um, it's all collected, it comes out as leachate. We, our management strategy for PFOSs in the state are to identify sources of PFOS, prioritize those sources, and then provide treatment at those particular sources, work on source reduction, source identification, source reduction, and then if necessary, source treatment, as I mentioned, Casella the landfill as a result of everything that we put into the landfill that contains PFOSs, which are many, many things these days, um, that combined contribution of PFOSs, um, there's an enormous opportunity to provide that treatment at the landfill and eliminate those PFOSs from, um, you know, recycling into the environment. So we, um, we have the draft permit out. As I mentioned, we have a number of comments we've received and we're poised to move forward with uh, response to those comments, adjustment to the permit, and then potentially issuing it. So that's the status of where we are at Vermont DEC right now. Donna. Oh, what's the time limit here? You said you have the draft out. How long will it be out? The draft was, um, I should have said it in the past tense. The draft was out for a 30-day public comment period. We had a public meeting. We received all of those comments. We have those comments, and we're working how many pages of comments? 267 pages of comments. So that one is closed, uh, right? It is yes, closed. Yes, the comment yeah. period is closed, correct. Yeah. And we're working through processing all of those, developing response to comments, you know, evaluating, making additional tweaks to the discharge permit, and then, you know, pending where we're going with the issuance of a pretreatment permit and the jurisdiction for a pretreatment permit, we would, um, we would then move forward with the issuance process. So when you say, I, I may have understood what you said a little differently from the way, the way you meant it. When you say you are poised to issue the permit, that makes me think, I hear you saying, you support the permit, you're just about ready to go and sign off on it. Is when, it when we issued the draft permit, we, we supported the, the concept of the draft, but we put it out for public comment. We received those comments. We're working through the comments, responding to them, and making, you know, if, if necessary, making changes to the permit, we would then be poised to issue it. But every anticipation is that it will be issued when when you've completed the review. When we complete the review and make the necessary adjustments to okay. it, we, we'll, we'll be prepared to issue it. Yes. Great, thanks. Gary. So, if I understood what you said, that 
Uh, you only have the jurisdiction to issue this permit because Montpelier is accepting the discharge. So if we decided we're not going to take it anymore, then what would happen to all of that leachate? And would it be regulated at all? Or what happens then? We only can issue a pretreatment permit if there is a wastewater treatment facility in Vermont that would mm -hmm. accept it. That, that gives us the jurisdiction to provide the pretreatment requirements for it if it then goes, if, if there are no Vermont facilities that would accept it. Currently, Montpelier is the only facility mm -hmm. that does accept the leachate. If, if there were no Vermont facilities accepting it, it would go out of state and it would then be regulated by what it, whichever entity, you know, whether it goes to New Hampshire or New York or wherever it goes to, um, that particular state would then be responsible for issuing a pretreatment permit okay. if they chose to. Okay. Lauren. Yeah. Thank you. And appreciate you hanging in for a long night. <laughs> um, my question is, you know, so it was a big part of our discussion when we were kind of going back and forth a number of years ago about whether to keep accepting the leachate because of course it does have these contaminants you know it's very concerning to be bringing any PFAS into our community I mean and then there's everything else that's in leachate and knowing that it's persistent it's creating contamination you know so we're like knowingly contaminating our community but we wanted to be able to have this hook to be able to move forward with pretreatment um, I guess I'm curious how you would characterize your consideration for, I know that, you know, we're going to hear more about a proposal tonight on a, like, kind of newer technology. I believe there's other technologies that would perform better at removing PFAS. At some point, it becomes really, to me, just really hard to say that our community should continue accepting PFAS contamination, you know, despite this regulatory morass we're in. So I guess just like, how are you going to be weighing the fact that, you know, I know there's a proposal to do a technology that removes less PFAS than other technologies could because presumably it's cheaper. Um, so how are you weighing that? And I don't know how long we can stay at the table taking it if there's better technologies. And just curious how, you, how you're considering the different options. <laughs> no, it's, it's a good question. And, and certainly, Heather and Amy, you should, you should chime in. But I guess I would say that part of the, the one of the requirements of the permit that we're, we would propose to issue is a six-month pilot study. So to evaluate exactly how well this particular technology performs at removing PFASs from leachate. And again, leachate is a very, very difficult matrix. It's different than, than regular water treatment because it's so dense, it's so viscous, it, it clogs a lot of other treatment technologies. So looking at the operation, being able to evaluate the operation across the unit at its efficiency in removing many different PFASs. We're interested here in Vermont, the five regulated PFASs, but of course, as you know, there are many, many other PFASs. And how does it perform against not only the five Vermont regulated, but the other PFASs that do exist? Um, that's the purpose of the study. That's the purpose of the pilot study. So this amendment that we're proposing to issue, this, this, this permit amendment, it's an amendment to the existing pretreatment permit, would require Casella to operate this unit for a 180-day period and to, to scrutinize across the unit through um, pretty intensive monitoring how the unit's performing at, re at removing these PFASs. So that will allow us to really assess. Um, Casella, you know, we'll talk about some of their existing information, but, um, you know, allow us to assess it, how well this unit's working. Just and I don't mean to get ahead of the Casella presentation, but they'd shared it. So just like looking through some of the slides, it's showing like 60% removal of one of the PFAS, for example, if I, if I read it right and correct me if that, you know, like do we anticipate that it's going to get better and that they're gonna be refining the technology? And again, it is five of 14,000 PFAS. Like are we testing organic fluorine? Like are there ways to get at the fluorine content or something so that we're capturing more I know there's other, you know, protocols that can test for a lot more than just the five, mm -hmm. which it sounds like you're planning to do, which is great. Um, but, I mean, I guess, like, what are we going to learn? Like, we already know the EPA is saying there's essentially no safe limit of PFAS. Mm -hmm. Best case scenario, if this plays out the data that we're going to be presented, it still is not removing all PFAS, so we're still 
planning to move forward with a technology that's going to still result in PFAS contamination being brought to Montpelier. So I'm just trying to wrap my head around how this is a good outcome. If, if there's better technologies and if like your perspective is just there's no better technology out there and this is just, I mean, it, I know it's a really hard situation and mm -hmm. Casella, as you said, like has brought in all of the waste collectively that has all the PFAS and mm -hmm. it's this huge global issue. So, right. you know, I, I don't, I'm not trying to like demonize anyone, but I'm just trying to get like the best outcome, the mm -hmm. cleanest yep. water and not le result in contamination, so. As we are too. Yeah, yep. yeah, so I guess just like, what are you expecting to see that's gonna be, tell a story that would be like, yeah, this is a great outcome if we're already seeing it doesn't remove all PFAS and then what are we doing about that? Like, I mean, I, I, I'm sorry, I, no, go ahead. I think that it's important to kind of like back up a little bit just for people to understand. You, you do realize that there is PFAS coming into the influent already just from the consumer products that your residents are using. So talking about removing all PFAS from the leachate you're not going to even be able to remove all PFAS from your influent coming into your plant from just regular residential use. I'm not saying like one's better than the other, but you're you're taking a highly concentrated um, form from all of our waste from our trash, but you're still getting your residential product stream coming into your plant. So you're not going to be able to remove that either. Yes, but we are choosing as a city to right. import a PFAS contamination, right. and so that's a very, like, I agree, yeah. um, also, like, there's legislation to ban more PFAS from more products, yeah. like, there's a lot of work going on, like, I totally yeah. hear you, and, like, this is a piece we can control, mm -hmm. yep. and so it, that's not a very satisfying answer to me. I think, um, you know, it, we should wait, we, you know, we're going to, we'll stay here and, and, and be able to answer better, um, or discuss better after Casella presents the results um, of what they've been able to do so far. Um, there are other process steps that they can continue to take too, looking at things like certain additives that might enable them to better remove some of the PFASs. So it's a, it's a real emerging technology. Um, this is cutting edge across the country right now, what we're trying to do with this leachate treatment here in Vermont. Um, and so the 180-day pilot study will give us a lot more data as to you know how the unit is performing once it's really fine-tuned if they look at different additives you know what does that do to the overall performance of the unit so you know again that's the purpose of the pilot test is to really because this is new technology to be able to evaluate how will this technology perform in a tough matrix like leachate so it will I think the pilot study will give us a lot of answers um, to, you know to some of your great questions and just to kind of add on about the, the analytical techniques that you were speaking to, the method for detection of multiple PFAS in this matrix has now been accepted by the EPA, and so it's something that allows us to use that method. We're not just asking them to measure the five PFAS, we're asking them to measure all the quantifiable PFAS that exist in an approved method at this point, and if there are different types of analyses that can be added to the permit for a requirement for determining, you know, like you're speaking to uh, uh, the organic fluorine d tests, those kinds of things that emer it's an emerging contaminant with emerging testing techniques. And so we've tried in the permit to maintain, at, to stay at the cutting edge, not only of the technologies that are being used, but the testing that's being used in order to quantify to the best of the abilities that are out there now. Again, just sort of speaking to our overall management strategy for PFASs in the state, it's to identify the largest sources and try to apply the best technologies to, you know, to remove those PFASs, to try to limit, as you mentioned, we're awash in it, right? I mean, it's, it's in rainwater, it's everywhere. So it's a really tough problem. Gary. Can you um, just clarify a little bit more about the 180-day pilot study and what happens at the end of that and what you're looking for and what, you know, what conditions will trigger what response? Sure. So uh, the permit, the draft permit amendment that we put out asks, gives them some time to prepare for that pilot study and then within four months of the permit being issued, they need to start the pilot study. It needs to run for at least 180 days to collect data for us to be able to analyze according to EPA's techniques to set the limits based on that technology. And so once that pilot project data collection period is over, 
we'll start that data analysis and we will depending on where we're at in the permit cycle when that comes through we'll either reissue a new permit with limits in it based on that analysis and the the type of tech the technology that's being used uh, or we'll amend the permit again depending on it because it's a five-year permit and you can amend it until it needs to be renewed the the system will be allowed to continue to run and treat the PFAS and continue to be removing PFAS from the waste stream even until we get those permit limits and then at which time those permit limits are promulgated they'll have to be able to consistently meet those to stay in compliance with the permit so so they have six months and we see how it goes we see what they're able to do and then what they're able to do determines the limits that's how the technology-based affluent limit procedure works it actually balances the cost that's going into running the unit and the technology that you're get you're using and the, the maintenance of the system and the uh, the results that you get out and we have received a lot of comments on the permit about setting goals which is very challenging because we don't have water quality standards, surface water quality standards for PFAS at this time. So setting numeric limits based on source uh, receiving water protection is not quite available to us, which is why we're taking this technique of, of trying to reduce as much as possible the PFAS that's coming in from this very concentrated source. So I would say that in, to summarize my answer is that essentially we we have as part of our comment response period some things to consider as to how we set successful metrics for the pilot project as we're finalizing the permit issuance here mm -hmm. okay thank you so, so what's the incentive for casella to improve the product the results uh, once the limits are set based on what they can achieve at that point in time after 180 days What's what's the what's their incentive to improve the process? Well, frankly, at, at this point, the incentive is being driven by the Montpelier requirements for receipt of right. the leachate, and so the evolution of the way that the regulations are happening, it will depend on what you know what requirements are in place at any given time. So first it will be the technology-based affluent limits. Eventually EPA is going to have surface water quality limits that, we, that Vermont will adopt. Those likely won't be protective enough. So we, we're trying to take this approach to stay ahead of the federal regulations mm -hmm. and be as protective as possible without having very solid numbers for surface water protection. EPA has been working for several years now on developing water quality standards aquatic for aquatic there are two different types of, of water quality standards ambient water quality standards human health protection and protection of aquatic organisms they've been working for several years on the aquatic organism part of that they currently have out in draft form for public comment nationally water quality standards for two of the PFAS's PFOA and PFOS um, those standards are orders of magnitude higher than what we're seeing in ambient waters here in Vermont. So they won't be the limiting factor, it will, which is why we're doing the technology-based effluent limitation. Optimizing the performance of the unit is, I mean, it's uh, running the unit in an optimized way. As you, again, we're, jump, we're, we're, we're giving a spoiler alert for, I think, what you'll hear from Casella. So why don't we be happy to come back to your question after you see some of the, the latest performance data from from Casella. But but sort of the question, as I understand it, is is shouldn't we be looking for some kind of mechanism to drive them to constantly improving improve their performance? Mm -hmm. And if if the standard is based on their technology. Right. that they're available to do now what's the driver for constant improvement we don't have the baseline 
you know, because this is cutting edge, where we don't, there's not a proven method that we can point to and say you need to do as well as this method because treating leachate for PFAS is right now, there's really not, uh, nationally, there's not much, if any, information as to how that can be done. The use of this unit on this foam fractionation technology that they're using uh, on leachate um, is a, is a, a new concept, relatively new concept, I'll say. So, um, and another question that may seem kind of nebulous, but I'll throw it out there. We've got measurements here for five out of fourteen thousand compounds. Is is it safe to say that the efficacy of of this technology on those other 13,995 tracks the efficacy of the five? No, they're <laughs> all, the it, it, PFAS is an incredibly difficult subject and the, uh, there, are, there are different estimates of how many different PFASs are out there. It, though they're out there, there are m far fewer that are actually used commonly to the point that they're going to create concentration issues. Right now there are a couple, two of which I mentioned a moment ago, the PFOA, PFOA and the PFOS, you know, not PFAS, which is the assemblage, but PFOS, those are the two that raise the most concern. They're um, uh, older compounds that, because they're older, they're found um, in a lot of the trash. Um, they're also um, more problematic in terms of the research, the epidemiological and the aquatic life research, they're more problematic. So we're really focused on those. There are, it's seemingly infinite variations of how you can create a molecule with fluorines hanging off of it, um, and many, many different properties that resulting from that. But though there are that many, there are a more limited set that you actually see um, in troubling concentrations in um, in consumer products and in you know in, in trash, mm -hmm. but they're they're really really hard to to generalize. Okay, thanks. Any more, Lauren? Sure. So just kind of like building on Terry, so this technology is piloted. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, and we set our standard based on that, but meanwhile there are better in emerging fields, there's mm -hmm. better technologies mm -hmm. that are developed and found. Yeah. Can we require a transition to a new technology or are we locked in It's to a five-year permit. So. So, that, so for five years we yeah. live with this, but mm -hmm. then you could force a new standard that you could only be found with a new technology or updates to this technology like a... Hypothetically, phased. yes. I mean, the, fi the permit, though it's a five-year permit, there is a general reopener clause that we put in our permit so we can reopen a permit at any given time. Will there be new technology that comes along that quickly that we would reopen a five-year permit? I don't know. Um, I'd say probably not, but, um, but it is a five-year permit. So every five years it's renewed. And you know, if there are different standards that come along, again, Vermont is, is way ahead in this. Our neighboring states, New York and New Hampshire, do not have this requirement. Mm -hmm. But anytime, say there's a new technology that someone, people decide is generally considered to be, be better and it's developed, I can imagine Casella or any company who started with the one that we have now to say, well, geez, we already invested 800,000, 1.7 million, whatever it is in this old thing. We need to get our money out of that before we can justify making the change, right? We, we hear that a lot from the regulated industry in general. We hear it from municipalities when it comes to nutrient reduction or reduction of, uh, we're constantly adjusting. We, we typically, we receive standards from um, the federal government. They work on developing new and different water quality standards. Every three years, we reevaluate our water quality standards as a rule here in the state, also subject to federal approval and we ratchet down on um, this most recent round, we came up with new standards for copper and for aluminum. Um, you know, we typically are reducing, you know, the, the limits 
uh, for discharges into the environment, you know, from wastewater treatment facilities. We, as you well know, we did that um, several years ago with the Lake Champlain TMDL and ratcheted down uh, significantly on phosphorus discharges on the western side of the state, on the eastern side of the state. We're looking at nitrogen contributions to Long Island Sound, so we're constantly revising permits and ratcheting down on those requirements. We never can go up through a concept called anti-backsliding, but we can go down and we do. And we, you know, that costs are an issue. We, we hear about cost issues from most regulated entities. But <laughs> at the same time, we have standards, whether they're effluent treatment standards or water quality standards or TMDL-based standards that we, we push out and, um, you know, hopefully are able to provide funding to ameliorate some of the impact on communities, but we, that's our job. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Tim. It's almost 10 of 11. I'm just thinking, if we finish this item, we've got other people waiting for other items. Should we let them go home and at least get some track on how we're going to end this meeting? <laughs> well, I, I think, I've, I've been thinking Kurt, that same Kurt. question. It's, it's, it's just Kurt, it's, it's, it's Kurt. Kurt, right, because what, what we have after this is the water sewer and uh, budgets and water line replacement plan. Now, that's, that's a big deal, and, uh, and we've been eager to dis discuss this for a while. Um, I don't know if people are willing to stay past 11 to have a full discussion of that, but but since it's just Kurt, I think we 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 cross that. We we deal with that when we get to it. I don't, I, and I'll take the temperature of the room once once we see how long this takes. Well, you've got mine. Yeah, yeah. I think, and I. Well, I know, and you're getting older, and so. <laughs> okay. Time to hear from. Casella, thank you. Thank you. This is great. Thank you very much. Uh, we're, we're glad to be here. Uh, Sam Nikolai, uh, Vice President of Engineering with Casella. With me I have Jeremy Labby, who is our General Manager at our Coventry Landfill, and Joe Gay, who is our Regional Engineer for the State of Vermont. Um, you guys have, have had the slides, so certainly we can try to keep this fairly brief, although we certainly want to give you any information that would help you in, in terms of, of this discussion. So. You recall we were here in July. Um, at that point, we had done uh, testing both in the field and bench scale, uh, and we're optimistic about getting our treatment system in. So the treatment system, uh, the full-scale system, started in August of this year. And so the results that we're going to talk about tonight are a compilation of data starting in August uh, going into the, the present day. So a reminder. You know, this is the foam fractionation technology. Um, Ms. Hurl had, you know, good points and questions about, well, why did we select this particular technology? You know, the primary reasons were that um, we found it to be effective in the exact characteristics that PFAS um, creates problems with. PFAS was used by manufacturers as a coating. It likes the water-air interface, and so when you aggressively foam you drive the PFAS into the foam. That combined with the uh, amount of low foam that we were able to generate, which is a critical function, led us to this technology. Um, we did not do a bid process for this technology. We did not select the lowest bid. We evaluated several vendors. We selected, we thought, the best vendor that we thought would be the most effective. Um, admittingly, it's a 
a field that continues to evolve and grow. There are a lot of very smart people in universities working on this problem, um, but it does appear not only from our work, but uh, nationally throughout the country that foam fractionation is sort of leading the pack as what people are finding as the most effective uh, for managing these technologies or managing these compounds. So these are the results that you're seeing. You can see that we get very effective removal of four of the five compounds, but we do struggle a little bit with the fifth compound, PFHPA. So we're in, in between that 96 and 99% removal, which we think is excellent. The PFHPA has not um, been consistently 66. It goes up, it goes down. We'll show a little bit of that. Um, it is a seven carbon compound. It's not necessarily a short chain compound. And I'm not sure we know exactly why it's been so difficult for us. We have some good working theories and we're expecting to continue to improve that in the pilot test uh, six, six month program. But there's no doubt that that is a, a compound that we've struggled to get consistent removal on. This is a chart that we showed you in July. In July, it was based on what we hoped we would be able to do. This is based on the actuals. So we're showing you the mass that's coming in to the wastewater facility, both from leachate and from the residential inflow on the left. And we're showing you what we're actually able to achieve through treatment on the right. So this is not new. You've, you've seen a version of this before, but we're very happy to report that the actual field conditions matched what we said we were going to do uh, you know, in July. And to be clear, the, the, uh, the units are grams per day. So in all that we get from you, before we were getting two-tenths of a gram per day in, in how many truckloads? One truckload a day? No, this was 30,000 gallons, around roughly 30,000 gallons a day. And now it's down to? 0 0.02. OK. <laughs> so a, a gram is a, the weight of a paper clip. So a fifth of a paper clip is, is what we're seeing. And we're getting that down to uh, a 50th of a paper clip. So we're dealing with really small concentrations and really small amounts of mass here, which is challenging, of course, both from a removal and a quantification standpoint. But even that quantity is hazardous to health. Even these very low concentrations, so the, the levels of, that we evaluate and then regulate for PFAS are a full magnitude below traditional compounds. So we're measuring lower and we're being held and identifying health impacts of those lower concentrations. OK, thanks. Again, this is a, a graph you've seen before. It's really the same data showing you into the pie chart. So we're really shrinking the, the amount of PFAS that you're coming down from leachate to a very small amount. I certainly appreciate Ms. Hurl's comments that it, it is new. It's coming into the facility as opposed to the residential. Um, but the whole goal here is for us to remove this and get as low as possible so that's not providing an impact to the wastewater facility. This is probably the meat right here. So now, instead of percentages, you're actually seeing the concentration data. So on the left, you're seeing the, the data before treatment. So all those colored bars represent the various of the five PFAS compounds, and you're seeing the variation over time. So it kind of goes up and down um, you know, over the, the weeks and months. On the right, you're seeing the, the treated and you can see by color, we're very successful in everything except for the blue. The blue is that recalcitrant compound that we have trouble removing. You do see that we were successful in two samples in early November where we actually got the results down and met the drinking water standard. And those are the only two times we've been able to do that, where we've gotten all five low enough that we were below the 20. So we know it can be done but we've not been able to do it consistently with especially that fifth compound. The other four compounds essentially are at the drinking water standard or right at it or above or below it. That fifth compound is the problem child and that one is uh, up and down a little bit more. 
still we're very, very pleased with this level of progress and the amount of removal we're getting, acknowledging that we've got to continue to try to find solutions to get that fifth compound a little bit lower. I'll point out, interestingly, that fifth compound is the only one of the five that is not part of the federal drinking water standards. So only Vermont is regulating that fifth compound. EPA is not going to regulate today that fifth compound. So it's interesting that everybody has their different perspectives on which of the compounds are supposed to be regulated. That fifth one is only in Vermont today. Nevertheless, we're doing our best to get as much removal as we can. Um, again, I think you know, we want to share this data just showing you know, the magnitude of the reduction. And again, you can see our, our um, PFHPA, that fifth compound at the bottom, is the only one that we continue to, to show higher concentrations. This is the, the blue is Montpelier's influence. Yep. To the earlier point that um, DEC made, you know, the two compounds that are of the largest concern are those, to those top two compounds, PFOA and PFOS. Those are the ones that have the most study. Those are the ones that have the most standards that everyone is focused on. And we do a, a very effective job of removing those two. It is only the fifth compound that we have a little more trouble with. Um, we wanted to try to graphically represent how this closed loop is working because it really is a closed loop. Um, in Montpelier, you guys are generating waste and biosolids coming from the wastewater plant that's coming to the landfill, that is being managed at the landfill. We're sequestering PFAS within the landfill. That's where the vast majority of the PFAS lies. Then we're sending the leachate back to you. It's being treated at the wastewater plant. So you've got this loop back and forth, and we wanted to kind of show you a little bit graphically what that loop is. So on the left is the estimate of PFAS that you're sending to us in, in mass. So you're sending us waste that contain PFAS. You're sending us biosolids that contain PFAS, like every other community in Vermont. So nothing unique there. But this is the portion that Montpelier is sending us. And I assume our profile is pretty much indistinguishable from other uh, communities. Yeah. Yeah. So that data does not include household trash only because we really don't understand how much PFAS is in household trash. Um, but that does include bulky furniture, carpets, things of that nature. And so we certainly could produce that graph for any other community in the state of Vermont and it would look very similar. On the right, of course, is then what we're sending back to you. And we, we share this to say, we're doing everything we can to try to get this mass as low as possible. The ultimate solution is that we're sequestering that PFAS in the landfill as much as possible. And we don't want to lose that, acknowledging that we want to get it out of the leachate as well. And the further reductions are intended to do that. So really to give you a, a cap of where we are today, the system has been operating since August in an exterior containment, uh, what we consider a temporary location. We are very close to finishing the building. It's in its final stages, electrical, plumbing. We're expecting in a matter of weeks to be um, completed with the building. We'll have a two to three week period where we are move the system from its exterior location inside the building to its permanent home and then we expect the permit to be issued from, the, from DC and to go into that formal pilot testing period. And I think the agency has already talked about sort of the schedule going forward uh, from 24 into 25. I think the only thing that I would add perhaps to the earlier discussion is that part of our obligation on the pilot testing is not only to report the data, but also to report what we were doing, what's happening temperature-wise, what's happening climate-wise, what's happening at the landfill, so that the agency can track and see what the differences are. So there isn't any way for us to game the system where to say we're only going to do certain things, that they're going to see our behavior as we try to get as low as possible. Presumably, as we identify what are those factors, what's the way we operate the system that gets the most bang for our buck, then the limits will reflect that.
And that long 180 day period is intended to shake those kinds of questions out over that time frame. Most of us have toured uh, Montpelier's wastewater recovery facility. So just out of curiosity, what does the machine that does this look like? How big is it? So we'll, we'll jump back to the earlier slide. It actually comes in a shipping container. Hmm. So okay. it's a fairly compact footprint. Oh, that's I think, it. Okay. I think my friend Jeremy would yeah. tell you that he would love it, yeah. that it wasn't so compact because it's difficult work to work on <laughs> and, and maintain. Try, yeah. um, but that, that shipping container essentially will go inside of our building. So gotcha. it's a fairly modest footprint. There are tanks and filters and other infrastructure that are going to be outside of, of that box, but all inside the building itself. Yeah, Thanks. I mean, the associated infrastructure, it's a 60 by 60 building, so it's not a small building um, because you have tankage for the concentrate that comes off the back end, which one of the benefits of home fractionation that most of the other separation technologies don't provide is that it, it, it gives it in a, a manageable fraction. You know, people are like, well, reverse osmosis works better. Well, it doesn't really because it takes 1,000 gallons of leachate and it gives you 800 gallons that looks really good and 200 gallons that you don't know what to do with, right? And so this one will take 50,000 gallons and turn it into 50 or 100 gallons that we can solidify or we can destroy because destruction technologies are not there where they can process large volumes yet. And they're still years away from being having that ability to do so. You know, we're keeping our eyes on it. But... There's all that stuff that needs to be inside that building too, the tanks to supply leachate back and forth, the concentrate, the stabilization that we're going to use or destruction that we may use someday down the road needs to have room. So it's quite involved. It's a multi-million dollar project. It's not that we, you know, I, I, I've heard the concept of us cheaping out. We did not. We looked at what the best technology was. In fact, when we initially did our study, this wasn't even considered uh, when we did our study that the state had mandated we do. And they asked us to look at it because it had come out in that time frame. And we did look at it, added it to our list of potential candidates with Brown and Caldwell and said, this looks really promising. We want to go down this path. So uh, it is a small container for a lot of stuff. Yes. And it comes from Australia. Um, so it's really hard to work on at times unless you're small and you have really small hands. <laughs> um, but it is a really, really cool technology. And when we have it in the facility, we'd love to bring you up for a visit if you were interested. I think... We are probably going to be the first commercial operation of one of these in the entire country, um, and one of the first landfills treating all of our leachate in the entire country. So, you know, we're, we're setting the tone for the rest of the country with this, and uh, I'll stop talking now. Yeah, I'm interested. So. Yeah. Happy to address any questions the council may have. Okay. Anybody have any questions? Um, so. Uh, just two things, I guess. What, what else is in the leachate that we get, and what, and what, what does the leachate itself, with everything that it contains, how does it affect our, our facility when it gets here? So that's a big part of what DEC has done with this current permit and did with previous permits. So forget about PFAS for a second. Part of being permitted to come to the facility was to ensure that the wastewater plant could mm. properly manage what's in the leachate. Leachate is primarily a mix of organic compounds, so it, it tends to be a little bit higher in BOD than your traditional wastewater, but very similar. It does have a fair amount of ammonia, which has to be monitored and has to be evaluated, and it does have a fair number of metals, which have to be um, also tested for. Um, but that evaluation is, is part and parcel of the pretreatment permit, and, and the agency would not allow us to take it to wastewater plants if it were not able to be treated. Mm -hmm. So you're, um, you're measuring the, the content of those, those sorts of organic chemicals at, at your end, but uh, so we know what's, uh, what the percentage is in what, what is sent to us, essentially. We know what the mix is. Joe, you can speak to our, our current monitoring programs. Yeah, so we, we sample quarterly for um, volatile organic compounds, semi-volatile organic compounds, metals, chloride, ammonia, um, and report that to the agency. The city gets a copy. Um, in this newer permit, we're also testing for PFAS monthly. Um, that report goes in with our monthly report. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so we're looking at the analytical quarterly for, uh, for our leachate. And how is it? actually transported in a tanker truck or yep. something? Uh -huh. 
Yes. And what happens if that truck spills and we have leachate, you know, on the highway? It, it would certainly be considered a release. We're, we're the um, has to be reported, has to be cleaned up, um, as it would for any other kind of release. Um, you know, and, and similar to um, if there were a gasoline truck or a, mm -hmm. um, a other kind of vehicle. I haven't heard of it happening, but it's not. It's not a toxic material. Uh -huh. It's not a hazardous material. It's it's a wastewater. Um, well, metals, ammonia. We would spring into action and and uh, uh, clean up the release. We'd assist the state emergency response, mm -hmm. um, and any any material would uh, end up back in the land. So no, no East Palestine uh, scenario. No. Yeah. No. I mean, it, leachate needs to be treated because of the organic uh, and metals that it contains. Mm -hmm. um, but, but you know, this is not a hazardous material. It's not a flammable material. It doesn't rise to the level of kind of the rail disasters we've seen, uh, unfortunately, on the news recently. But if it spilled out on the ground, you'd presumably have to excavate, you know, dig up a lot of the whatever soaked it up, and that would be going back up to your place. It would. Yeah. Uh, just one other thing, go going back to my earlier question uh, with the DEC folks, um, uh, it's, I mean, it seems to me that you, you're you're pursuing this um, vigorously. I mean, you you started at much lower levels of treatment and have continuously brought them up. But the only incentive for you to continue that once the limits are set based on the 180-day pilot is non-renewal of the permit. Is that, in fact, the case? Or do you have, are there other limits in the permit? Are there any incentives in the permit other than non-renewal? There won't be a, a written incentive in the permit. The incentive is going to be that while all of us, I think, are frustrated that we don't know what the right limits are, they're coming. Uh, EPA doesn't move nearly as quickly as any of us would like, but there will be limits one day, and we want to be able to utilize the technology to get below those limits, or know that, that the technology cannot get below those limits. And when mm -hmm. that happens, we're going to have to implement technology that does. Now. We, one of the reasons that we like this technology is that we believe it will be very adaptable to add on to. It, there are other technologies that could go in front or behind to help improve it. So we feel confident, and one of the reasons why we pulled the trigger as early as we did, that it's getting us better removal than, than we think we'll achieve otherwise. And we will see <laughs> what the regulations bring us. But rather than wait another five years for EPA to figure out what the right number is, this is what I would think of an interim step. And our goal then, and our incentive, is to ensure that we're leading the way, finding ways to further remove it, because eventually there's going to be a number that comes out from EPA. That, and I'm sure you're curious as to why it worked in November so well. <laughs> and you haven't yeah, been able to duplicate it. Yeah. yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I mean, this is, this is I mean, it obviously it can it can do a better job with that. We have some working element. theories. We're we're looking forward to testing those out. I think the agency's looking forward to hearing from us and and testing those out. And you know, we're excited that we're not dealing with oh five percent removal to ninety five percent removal. No, we're mm -hmm. getting good consistent results. We got to find a way to improve that one compound. So it's tweaking around the edges and and continuing. Remind to me. What, what you do with the foam once, once you've processed it, processed it? So today, the, the foam is allowed to return to a, a liquid state, um, combination of spraying it and, and just time, so that it gets back to a liquid. Um, and we essentially um, mix it with a mortar mix, a, a cementation mix, and bind up that liquid so that it then could go back into the landfill. The reality is the landfill is a full cycle. So in theory, it could go right into the landfill and go around and around and around, and it would always be captured. But by putting it in the mortar mix, we bind that up so that it can't escape and it's going to stay as a solid material. We know that solid materials do a really good job of staying in the landfill because we've seen the graphs that say 
pay for all these waste materials, the vast majority of PFAS stays in the landfill. Is a small amount going to leach out? We don't know. That's one of the things we'll, we'll work to evaluate. Mm -hmm. But regardless, it'll be in that closed loop so that it can never escape that landfill environment. Thanks for all this. I mean, really from where we started a year ago, it is great to see the progress. And I do think the ability to continue working together as challenging and frustrating <laughs> as it is to have this huge contaminant. Um, and I'm really encouraged to hear the idea of maybe, you know, adding a reverse osmosis system or something down the line if we still can't figure out how to get, I mean, it looks just from Googling it, like that's caused, like nobody's figuring out very well how to capture that particular, because <laughs> it's a shorter chain PFAS and it's a breakdown product of other PFAS and all that. So um, I'm sure you won't be alone in trying to figure out how, how to get it out. But um, yeah, I think just obviously, like from my perspective, just continuing to try to get as little PFAS back out into the environment as possible is the goal. So that's the lens like that for me, I'm bringing to this and, you know, talking to a lot of community members here who are kind of baffled why we even continue to take it. Um, but yeah, I guess I'll just, I'll leave it there, <laughs> but <laughs> it's getting late. Anybody else? All right. Where do we go from here? Speaking about full circle. Yeah, right. Thanks, this is great. All right. Um, again, Kurt Modica, Public Works Director. This is Chris Cox, Chief Operator of the Water Resource Recovery Facility. So I um, just wanted to wrap up the presentation or the discussion tonight. Um, with just some of the implications with the decision that council does make. You've heard a lot of it already, but there are a couple of things that we have not covered. Um, the first is we have a, a really large um, upgrade planned for the wastewater plant, and um, we're just starting work on that now. Recently signed the final design contract with our uh, consulting engineer, and um, there are some components of, um, of the plant um, that are um, that we need to consider whether um, we take leachate or not as we work to upgrade those. So uh, the first, the biggest one is the UV system. Um, that wasn't initially in the project scope, but we recently found out that our UV system is no longer going to be supported um, for parts. So the ballast cards are called. Um, they did one last run of manufacturing them. We bought a bunch to get us through the next three years, um, but that system will have to be replaced. Um, there are alternatives to UV. Uh, parasitic acid is something that uh, we could potentially utilize that works well with leachate acceptance. Um, so we just need, in order to advance our project, and we're in the process of doing that, um, we really just need a decision from council so that we can proceed accordingly with the upgrade. Um, another component is the ARPA grant. So the city was awarded um, a $1 million pretreatment grant, um, and uh, we're allowed uh, up to $100,000 for uh, administrating that grant. If we do not accept leachate, um, then, uh, you know, we're not, we're not really, it, it's hard to justify the grant to the city um, because we're no longer accepting pretreated leachate. Uh, so that is on hold now until um, council makes a decision about the future of leachate acceptance. Uh, again, <clears throat> DC um, discussed the regulatory oversight piece, so uh, there will be no more regulatory oversight should the city not take leachate. Um, and environmental impacts. So um, I think what, what we're, where we started with council really setting limits and clear goals for Casella has really moved this process along, and I think that's a great success story for one player and the council. Um, but if we don't take leachate, um, there's a lot more uh, trucking 
that goes along with moving the material out of state. Uh, so there's you know carbon emissions associated with that, environmental impacts, um, and m the majority of the leachate is still going to end up um, uh, being discharged into Lake Champlain. The Plattsburgh is the primary alternate discharge point uh, for leachate for Casella. So it's just it's hard to see that there's any environmental gain. I think there's a lot of environmental uh, negatives if we um, if the city decides not to accept leachate. And then finally is the financial impacts. Um, so we, our, the budget, if we get to that tonight, um, it does not include uh, leachate revenue. So there's an opportunity to amend proposed rates, which will be another discussion later on. Um, so uh, each load we take right now, we're taking one load a day, and that equates to about $100,000 a year. Um, the most we have taken in the past is four loads a day. Um, so there's an opportunity for a financial benefit to sewer rate payers. And then are, on, uh, are they producing enough to for us to take again five, four loads a day if they uh, yes getting yeah. back nods from <laughs> yes they are yep. mm -hmm. flooding rain in a giant bathtub yeah. <laughs> gotcha and then the last um, financial component is our our sludge disposal so uh, like Sal said our uh, dewatered solids go to the landfill and um, we have very low rates from Casella because we take the leachate. Um, so there's, uh, it would, you know, Casella would likely um, need to put our rates to market rate, which is essentially double what we pay now. So that would be roughly a, like a quarter million dollar annual uh, additional cost to the city. Um, So with all of, of those things for council to consider, um, I, I did draft up a draft motion and uh, open to modifications to this should any council members want, but this is um, what we tried to find is a balance of um, maintaining accountability and treatment until the state permits are actually issued and we have clear levels established of, um, of treating treatment uh, amounts or levels on the on the Vermont drinking water standards and the reason we're focusing so much on the Vermont drinking water standards is because that's was the direction from council initially is um, to meet Vermont drinking water standards which Casella is not able to do now um, but they have made great progress and I and I um, as you heard they said they're going to continue to try to improve on that process uh, so the way this is written is um, is to try to find the balance of allowing us um, to uh, continue with acceptance of leachate for all the reasons I mentioned in the previous slide um, uh, until their permits, well, and then at limits of 80% reduction, so that's kind of the average of all five being reduced, all five components in Vermont that are regulated being reduced by 80% until their discharge permit is issued by the state at which time we would revert to requiring them to meet that permit. Um, so I can read the whole motion, but I think that's uh, for a council member if they want to, but I'll turn it over to you for discussion. Okay, any comments or Carrie? Yeah, just, just a quick question. The 80% that is uh, looking at all five of them together, not each one. That's correct. Yeah. Um, I, I think this uh, discussion really puts Montpelier into an interesting position you know, because we we regulate the housing within the city with zoning or whatever we pave our roads we uh, we do all this stuff that really affects the city of Montpelier um, this decision puts us in a position of really influencing the environmental regulation system and the environment outside of Montpelier because we're the linchpin to state regulation. And, uh, and I think that's, uh, for, for us to want to be a player in improving the environment, not only within Montpelier but uh, outside of Montpelier, it's an opportunity we don't often have. Donna. Well, and, and along with those lines, 
sometimes they also can it's an opportunity to take responsibility i mean we put the same stuff in our landfill so that we're responsible for it and i don't see shipping it off to plattsburgh to go back into the lake i'd rather see us be assertive we've had partners that have been very responsive and i would propose that we i make a motion to recommend the motion that kurt laid out here word for word is there a second Okay. Thank you. Um, Go ahead. So, if the if you're talking about an aggregate, is the, you're talking about an average. Is there a difference between an average and an aggregate? How is it calculated? Eighty seems low to me, given the results that I'm looking. I'm looking at ninety-eight, and ninety-nine, except for the one sort of recalcitrant version. Yeah. Um, right. So the sum of all um, the pre and post treatment with an 80% reduction from the initial number to the final number. Okay. And and the wording is a minimum, so, um, you know, encouraging Casella to do, to do better, if they can. <coughs> Tim. So now we're taking 8,100 gallons a day. This doesn't seem to have any limits on that. Is, is that still the same amount, or are, they, is, are you considering yep. more? So I do have the first part of the motion um, notes that the limits will be approved by public works staff and within our existing discharge permit. So we have a limit uh, on gallons per day of what we can take in our permit now. Um, I think we believe that's around 60,000 gallons a day. We don't anticipate getting to that level anytime in the near future, but um, so really what it would be dictated by is um, you know, Chris is primarily Chris's comfort level um, in, um, in what the plant can accept and, and treat effectively. Yeah, I'm, I'm gallons a day, we're taking almost 2.1 million gallons a year of this stuff, um, and running it right through and sending it up the river past a lot of other communities too to get to the lake. I, I'm not there. Any other comments from members of the council? Lauren. I'm kind of struggling with the math still of the 80% of the five. Maybe it's because it's 1124 at night. It's not helping. Um, like one piece of this that I definitely don't like is that we will revert to the, D the DEC permit standard like I would want to see what that was I feel like us setting out the 20 parts per trillion the drinking water standard even though it wasn't an existing surface water standard as a goal has kind of pushed the conversation and the process forward and set a, an ambitious target for this whole process I want us to continue doing that I mean 80 percent I was trying to do the math it seemed like you could set a higher number based on like just the averages they're showing us right now so um, I, I think we could go higher. Like, I want to be pushing for the best possible if we're going to go in this direction. And I, I don't think I would put that whole last section about, I think we should keep ours and push for it. We could always look if DEC goes lower than what we have or a more protective standard, we could uh, move in that direction. But they might go higher that we wouldn't want to. And we don't, I don't want to revert to a less protective standard. Um, if they're hitting it and able to achieve it because of what we're putting out there. So would you think it should be more like uh, where it says at which time, at which time the council would reconsider the uh, limit or something like that? Or what if, it, if at which time the standards are raised go to a higher standard? Laid out, da da da, -da. Lowered, probably, but, but yeah, I, okay. I see what you mean. Like a more protective standard. More protective standard. Um, or, or cut that whole sound. I, mean, I understand where you're getting at. You're right. It would be a good idea. I feel like maybe we could we could just revisit it. If I mean, I assume we'll get a presentation once the DEC. You know, we like inviting Casella in every six <laughs> months or so. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <guys. laughs> um, so I think I think. Yeah, I might like. I'd be more comfortable just 
getting rid of that, we could always revisit it and see and if it's more protective than so, moving that direction. So you, you'd put a period after standards and then to be reviewed in six months by the city council? Yeah, I think, I think something like that. I mean, I wonder too, I mean, if right now we're taking one truckload, I would love to not be increasing the amount we're taking. It's, I thought that was kind of getting us the amount where we could kind of send a truck. It was helping with our uh, other waste costs, I thought. Yeah, well, one of the one of the impacts is is if the city were not to take leachate, that we would pay market rate for solids disposal. So that but, was. But if we were, <coughs> but, but if we were still taking one truckload and not increasing it to. 60,000 gallons a day. Yeah, well, we, yeah, right. I don't anticipate us getting to 60,000. Um, I guess the ask at this point would be to the ability to go up to two loads a day. Um, that's likely all that we would that we would be comfortable with at this point is up to two loads. Put that in the in the motion. Would that would that help people's comfort level? What, what makes you comfortable about two loads <laughs> as opposed to three loads or four loads? I mean, what are you, what, what's the process you're using to evaluate that? You want to answer that? Um, yep, we are working through, um, we had before this year accepted up to four loads a day. Um, we had had some E. coli violations um, attributed to leachate, and so we are working with Brown and Caldwell and with Casella as well um, to try to understand what type of disinfection system we need to make sure we don't have any violations. Um, and we've, we've done studies, Casella's helped um, pay for those studies with, with Brown and Caldwell, and we're our comfort level is with two loads at the dilution, which is the, you know, mixed in with the influent that we're taking that we can comfortably meet our um, E. coli limits. And, and through this next phase, we'll be looking at UV systems or different types of disinfection systems that will allow us to take three, four loads uh, per day if necessary. So it's really a, an E. coli um, consideration. So if, um if we didn't do this, uh, and you have you need to replace this UV system, right? And you can do, you can p choose a system that will treat leachate or one that won't. Is that? Did I understand that correctly? There's right. a couple of options, and not all of them treat leachate, or or not as well. So there's, you know, mm -hmm. the end product or the end process of the plant is is disinfection, and there's a variety of ways to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and there's different costs associated with each operating and construction. So um, you've, uh, the leachate does, um, there's an acid within it that um, from the studies from um, Casella's engineer, an acid that can impact the light in the UV system that mm -hmm. um, reduces its effectiveness at higher, at high concentrations compared to the influent. So, um, so yeah, there are alternatives to UV, and we would look into more of those um, should the city decide mm -hmm. to take leachate. Uh, I, I don't know what the cost differences are, but would it make sense to look into that anyway, given that maybe the technology would change down the road, even if we didn't go this way tonight, that someday we may, I take it you don't want to replace the system every five years or I don't know how long it lasts yeah it, it just impacts the the financial picture of, of us being able to select the best long-term cost-effective alternative not knowing what the future is yeah okay <clears throat> yeah Casella has said that they'll work with us if we need to put in a UV system that is more robust or disinfection system that is more robust to accept leachate so they have offered to contribute financial assistance um, to that so just a continued partnership mm -hmm. Lauren back to the wording of 80% removal 
like if their total amount goes up, 80% removal could be more PFAS total. Like why are we moving away from a parts per trillion standard, which is what every other regulation uses? I mean, looking at their chart, like I can see it's way above 20, so that's, it's, is it because it's a horrifying number that we would have to propose? Like what's the thinking there? Um. I mean, I, I'm seeing them touching 500 occasionally, 300, if you're trying to set something that they could hit consistently, um, or yeah. I mean, 100 I parts per <coughs> trillion. Like, I know Rhode Island set a surface water standard of 70 parts per trillion. Like, yeah, um, it's, there is, um, there's a lot of fluctuation in, and what Casella is treating. So the, like they said, if there's a big rain event, it, the volume of leachate goes way up. Um, it's just an easier matrix for us to track. So we don't, we as public works, we don't want to be in the business of regulating permits. This is why I added the deferring to the state. That's really what the state does. Um, you know, we do public works permits, and, and but it's not a long-term monitoring. So that's pretty heavy burden on public works to put that on us long term um, and we're trying to find uh, they, the percentage is just an easier way for us to manage and check um, the removal rates and so what we would propose is that Casella would send us in the interim period until the state issues a permit they would send us the results we would you know they with a summary of the data and we would be able to you know check that relatively quickly rather than going by the exact parts per trillion moved under each parameter. Um, so it's a management ability for us, partially. It's just an easier uh, metrics to understand in, in, in some ways. Um, so, I mean, it's not it's just, <clears throat> there's no, I mean, we can change it if you want, but um, that was kind of the thinking behind it. I mean, it, it looks in their graph like they're, I mean, they're reported a month by month parts per trillion, like I would think that would be just whatever we ask for them. It's either a, a percentage or a parts per trillion measurement. I don't really understand why that's different. It just, a percentage feels like of what, and it, that could be changing over time. And so do we even know what we're getting then? It's like they just stamp off like, yep, it was 78 or 82% today, but of what? Whereas parts per trillion is like an absolute number that we can compare to other time periods. I, I would feel more comfortable with a standard that everyone else uses as opposed to this percentage that I've never seen. And I assume like DEC would be moving towards a part per trillion, I don't know, as opposed to like a percent removal standard. Um, Remains to be seen, but it's more likely to be a numeric standard. So it just, I don't know why we'd be setting a different type of standard than every other way that this is always regulated. It seems harder to gauge what's going on. So is that a number that's ascertainable so that either uh, Casella would report or we could ascertain in what comes in? Chris, you're shaking your head no. Wait, you should step up so because there are people there believe it or not there are still people at home uh, watching this we, we clearly have the lab data so we clearly can report the actual PPT um, our struggle was um, it's not as if we're getting that consistent 66 percent of that fifth compound it's been bouncing up and down so we were trying to give feedback to Kurt to say, what can we achieve? Really thinking that this was an interim step. We expect the state's number to be lower. And you certainly could clarify that and say, you have to meet the lower of, of these two items. That would be another way to, to capture mm -hmm. it. Um, but that was the reason behind the choosing that percentage. You, you're certainly correct, we have the PPT numbers it's just a, ma a matter of selecting well what ppt number do we want to to select and and that we're operating the system in an interim condition if you want to get it in the building get it in a controlled environment 
<clears throat> so we can understand and manage the, the system better too. This just allows us to get to that point before the permit is issued. Well, folks, are we going to get to the point where we're ready to make a decision tonight, or we sh should we? stop and take it up next time. <laughs> what are the time parameters? As far as the permitting. So do you need us to make the decision tonight? Do we have another two weeks, a month? But we're also accepting it now, and if we don't take action to change that, then it, you still have jurisdiction. I guess my only other encouragement would be you're really only setting path for six months. You're asking us to come back and talk about it. You're asking us to do the pilot study. You have the opportunity to then modify, ideally, we'll be able to share new data and better data. Um, this was our best guess of, of a number that drove us to continue to um, find ways to reduce it, um, but was at least achievable in the short term. And I'd encourage if the council could consider that and know that it has the authority to come back in six months and, and put something new on there. But that this is holding our permitting up in a way that's not as productive as probably we'd all like it to be. I guess I, I support the motion. I think it's, it's a tough choice. It's, the, um, it's a choice between two um, undesirable uh, outcomes, but um, we've come a long way. We're, I think, we're in in the in the end. We we may be contributing to a solution to a problem. Maybe not a complete solution, but I think we're improving the situation net net. Um, so I I would support this motion. Lauren, my sense throughout this process is us. For example, choosing the 20 parts per trillion helped drive better outcomes. So kind of going to an outcome that they think is already achievable as opposed to pushing for a better outcome seems like you've already, that will push a weaker DEC regulation because they're like, oh, the peop if you guys are willing to take it for a higher standard, great, then let's not push on progress. So to me, that doesn't accomplish it. I'd rather say 70 parts per trillion, which is the surface water standard in Rhode Island looks like if you average out, maybe that's like a monthly average or something. So, you know, so you can have some fluctuation day to day or, you know, give some like time for the technology to keep being tested. I don't know if that's a number. I'm trying to look at your graph and figure out a number that might be achievable over a month, but would still be pushing for progress. And, and maybe we could figure out the details part it's just that we, we have to then measure it right they're measuring it their report it's in their reports already well they're measuring it but we're verifying it right we're not so yeah well, do you want to move to amend right. the motion your graph and it's like 500 to zero and I can't really tell if could you like is that an achievable number at all or is that like impossible and off the charts as an average or a minimum? I mean, we've clearly been over it, right? I, I'm, I'm thinking an average. Like, I do when I understand it's a pilot, and I think giving time to work out the kinks, figure out how to get a better handle on this short chain one, and, um, like, to me, that still goes in the spirit of setting a target, but also, I don't know, not possible, which not is... Right now. Not with that single one.
Is there a number that you could meet <laughs> oh, as an average? Well, what if we designated the four and then designated the amount that you're reaching for the fifth? We pull the fifth out and make its own average. Would that work for you, Lauren? I guess depending on what it is, and is it trying to push towards finding a solution? Because I mean, there are technologies out there. Like you could add in a reverse osmosis and get there. So it's like it's a comes to be a financial decision, a technology, like figuring that all out. So if it's like this pilot can't actually meet a reasonable protective standard then like we need to know that and I don't want to just give up our <laughs> yeah I think that's right I think that they've done every time we've told them you have to do the, do something to improve what you're doing to uh, keep us going they, they've done it or tried to do it but but I think you're right we need to keep that pressure on right that's what you're saying and if we find out that what they're doing now doesn't work, then the, you know, the, the machine you have allows for uh, add-ons in front of the system to, uh, or out, outside of the system to make you do better. That's what I heard you say, say anyway. We would certainly be amenable to a target of 70 PPT to drive innovation. We're not meeting it today. So I don't think you can set a minimum because I'm worried that we'll fail instantly. But I have no problem with council saying we want to drive innovation. We want you to continue to strive to get as low as you can. You have a target of 70 PPT. Come back and report on it to us. Yeah, could we say 70 parts per trillion by the end of six months? I guess I would ask, it would be most productive if we got all the way through the pilot yeah. program. Mm -hmm. So that would be six months plus four, so perhaps the end of the year. Carrie. It's not clear to me that this technology is capable of getting it down that far. I, I think we agree. We, we don't know for sure whether we can. Do you think it's possible that it could get that low with this particular technology? Well, we did it. We did it, those two samples in early yeah. November. The question is whether we can isolate the behavior and the variation of leachate over time so that we can consistently get those results. And I, I'm, I'm being honest here, I don't know the answer okay. to that. We, we believe that this is the right pathway to go down and will be effective, but I don't know the answer. Lauren, or Donna, sorry. So if we set uh, that as a goal, and then it's close to you come to it, or maybe you make it, then we can judge that when you come back. But you could still set it as a goal, Lauren. I would support that. Could we amend, I believe it was Donna's motion. <laughs> yeah, it's Donna's motion. <laughs> um, to say, I mean, maybe we keep Kurt's proposed language of ensure a minimum of 80% aggregate removal of the five regulated compounds under Vermont drinking water standards with a goal of 70 parts per trillion combined and so maybe and maybe keep the until final issuance of the DC discharge permit at which time all treated leachate received shall meet the lowest of the two standards okay so that's a motion to amend Donna's motion are we ready to uh, vote on that motion? Is there a further discussion? Um, you know, people talk about high standards and low standards, so the lowest of the two standards is not what you mean. You mean the highest standard, but the lowest number, right? Good point. 
So what do we want to say? How do we want to say? I think I heard the stinging most protective. Most protective most standard. Most protective. <laughs> Good. All right, so that's the motion. Okay. All right, are we ready to vote on that? Can I get who the second was? Uh, the second one is Donna. Yep. Okay. Yep. Tim, do you have anything to say before we vote? Limited the quantity we're accepting, or are we just leaving that out there? We haven't limited the quantity as the motion. What we've heard from the department is that they would not at, at present be willing to accept more than two truckloads per day. And uh, whether we put anything in the motion or not, I think you're hearing from council that if you started to get a higher than that, we would want you to talk to us about it. Does that seem accurate? All those in favor of the motion, of Lauren's motion to amend Donna's motion, signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? No. Okay, we have a roll call. Um, Donna? Yes. Carrie? Yes. Sal? Yes. Tim? Lauren yes. and Pellin. Yes. Okay. The motion carries. We have amended Donna's motion. Do we have uh, any more discussion on Donna's motion or are we ready to vote on that? If so, I'm going to take a start, start out with a roll call. call. Uh, Donna? Yes. Carrie? Yes. Sal? Yes. Tim? Lauren, Pellin. No. Okay, we've uh, passed the motion. And uh, thank you for sticking with us. It's, uh, this is complicated and very important stuff. Um, and I appreciate all the work that everyone has done on this. Um, we're clearly not doing water and sewer budgets and water line replacement tonight. You know, it's already almost midnight. We're not doing that. Um, but thanks for staying. Uh, sorry? Yeah, exactly. That's right. <laughs> okay. City Council reports, Lauren. Actually, oh. before, before, before we do that, Kurt, we, we should decide when you want to do, because you're not here on the 28th, is that right? Yeah, right, that's school break, so I will be out that week. I will be remote that week. So, one idea. I could do it remotely, potentially, yeah. Um, well, I'll just say the other idea is if we're gonna meet next week, my review we could do that one we could do that first just nothing else just that yeah and that but way and then you'll still have time to do the zoning on the 28th yep yeah let's i think that's a good idea so that's mm -hmm. I'll throw that out. okay great thanks okay council reports starting with lauren just very quickly, reminder, public forum tomorrow night, 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. at Montpelier High School for the um, Montpelier Commission on Recovery and Resilience. Would love to see lots of people there. Um, do you want to unmute Palin? Helen, are you shaking your head? Do you not have a report? Yeah, no report. Okay. Want to make sure you're heard if you want to be heard. Tim. Yeah, yeah I really appreciate it. Yeah. Tim. Thank you. No report. Okay. Sal. No. Carrie. And Donna, do you have a council report? Oh, I did have something. Oh, yes. I received a complaint from a constituent who felt there was um, some bias in her timing with the cards, and she went back and set through the 
tape of our meeting, and she found herself at 3 minutes and 30 seconds, and I had her at 3 minutes and 25. However, she was correct that the person after her, I missed timing. <laughs> so he didn't get any cards. He talked only for four minutes, but she's totally right. He got more time. And so just to bring up to the council again, and it's very legitimate as much as I try to pay attention sometimes, I get listening and I forget to push the button. <laughs> um, so if indeed the council may want to consider to help it be more stable, some sort of more automatic timing, or I can set a timer that in three minutes goes off. I can still do the cards, but if I miss it, at least that three minute goes off. So think about that. I mean, before people didn't want a little buzzer uh, because it, you know, it's a little annoying. The cell phone buzzer isn't that bad. Um, but anyway, just think about that because it's, it's a legitimate complaint. So I just want to pass it on. Thank you. Oh, you should hear some of the cell phone buzzers that I set up at home. And some of them are quite unpopular, I can tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> Mayor's report, I second the uh, invitation for everyone to come to the Resiliency Commission uh, tomorrow night. We had a board of abatement meeting scheduled for tomorrow night, and we canceled it because we thought it was very important to give all the members of council the opportunity to come and participate and I will be there and I hope to see a lot of other people there. Um, annual report is out and available to be picked up. Is that right, John? I don't know. The annual report. No, the, the ballots, right? no, but I mean, the, don't we have the boxes with the an printed annual report already? I don't think so. Okay. I know of. Okay, I thought I saw them in the hall. Okay, it must have been. Years. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Those are available. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. As many as you want. <laughs> if you want to review last year's. Uh, um, I am, um, and then one other thing that I just want to mention because uh, I just, you know, it's more of a personal thing than a city thing, but once again today, in St. Louis, there were in Kansas City, there was another mass shooting, and we're up to something like 23 ma at the celebration for the Super Bowl. And we're up to something like 23 mass shootings in the United States already in 2024. And the, the reason that we continue to uh, allow this to go on is just uh, beyond me. And so it's something else that goes beyond the uh, borders of the city of Montpelier, but, uh, but we, are not, uh, we are not immune. And that's all I have. And clerk's report? Yeah, just um, to note that the, uh, tomorrow night's Board of Abatement meeting is not canceled, it is postponed until the following Thursday, um, the 22nd. And this should be the last one that's on the schedule until March 28th. So, but don't forget the postponed meeting. Mm -hmm. City manager. Uh, anything I had, I've forgotten. So we'll pass and we'll put it in the weekly memo or send out by email. Okay, and we'll get out notice because the uh, the notice is not uh, is not official yet, but. We will be meeting uh, next Wednesday, 6.30. It was going to be a special meeting, uh, but now we've got at least a couple of items, and hopefully that'll be it. And with that, we can adjourn at 11.55 p.m. As Councillor Hurl said.